Hello. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Hey, look at that. I have a Zoom background. Look at this. <laughs> Καλημέρα, χρόνια πολλά. Happy birthday. Happy Γεια σου, birthday. Γεια σου, Κάτια. Hi, Imran. Hi, Max. Hey, happy birthday, Manolis. <coughs> happy birthday. Hi. hi, Jerry. Indeed, hi. And Julie's here, too. Hi, Julie. How are you? Hi. This is awesome. Hey, Scott, you made it. Hey. Oh, Scott Erickson, hi. Hi, Jerry. Jerry, everyone, hi. Hello, everyone. Hi, Scott. Happy birthday. Hey. Thank you. Uh, hey, well, Peter. Um, hi, Veronica. Um, hello. Uh, hello, Manoli. Hey. Hey. <laughs> this is <laughs> awesome. Let me, let me find hey, Donna. Hey, Ramis. Hi, Parisa. <laughs> hey, hi, hi, Manoli. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Yeah, thank you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hello. This is awesome. Hello. Well, it's Ethan. So, Manoli, how many people do you Where are you calling from? Not next door, I hope. Knowing you, it's probably hundreds and hundreds. Hi, Luke. Yes, we're Hi, turning a hundred. Yeah. 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 Hey, Maria and Panayotis. What's up, guys? Hey, hey Daniel. God, I think of Do you remember Daniel from A Entry like a gazillion they're, years ago? Their 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 project, their vision. Hello, project. friends. <laughs> hey, Hi, hey. Christian. Hi, Christian. Hi, Natalia. Hi, everybody. Nice to see you. Hi, fancy microphone. Oh, hey, Nicole. How are you? Good. Happy birthday. Awesome to see you. Wow, Ned is looking younger every year. It's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> I know. She looks just like him. Your little baby. <laughs> Hi, Stephanie. Yeah. You might have a wall background behind you, but we can see the blue skies in the clouds in the, in the reflection. I miss you. <laughs> it's warm, it seems. <laughs> miss you so much. Happy birthday, darling. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Hey, David. Happy birthday. Thank you so much. Hey, Kunal. Locha. Happy you... birthday, Manolis. Thank yeah. you, Kunal. Hi, happy birthday. Hey, Lochan. I love uh, the, the fact that you managed to call from Machu Picchu. How's the connection? It's, it's actually really, really good. <laughs> and it's outdoors, so I don't need a mask. That's <laughs> awesome. I love that. Marina, it's a pleasure to see you. Happy birthday, Manoli. This is great. What a nice idea. <laughs> Thank you, Marina. I love your place. Where is that? Is that here? Uh, it's in Newton, actually. I see. Very, Very nice. sunny, but yeah. I just got my second shot last uh, yesterday, so I'm a little queasy. So I may turn off the video from time to time. No, just go, come over for some wine. <laughs> That's all I need. <laughs> According to CDC guidelines. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Luke. How are you? Good. I feel uh, very upstaged by everyone's backgrounds. I'm in like a conference room at the Whitehead, so <laughs> a little less glamorous. Well, I was hoping you were going to be in a, you know, the wall right behind that wall, actually. <laughs> no, no such luck this morning. A pretty awesome I've... fact is that Luke, uh, who is, you know, first author on this recent nature paper on progeria, is actually, uh, you know, grew up in like right behind that wall in our next door neighbor. <laughs> yeah, very small world. Hi, Naime. Hi, Shishen. Hi. Hi, my name is Hi. 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 <laughs> Lovely to see you. So this is, uh, this is a little funny, but I'm thinking of changing the plan a little bit and maybe creating some random breakout groups so you guys can all meet each other. <laughs> but, but maybe we're going to do a round of introductions so that everybody hears what everybody does. And then uh, we're going to do some um, uh, activities and uh, then we're going to go a flash round of question one and then a flash round of question two. Uh, Juan Enriquez, welcome, welcome. Un placer de verte. Un placer verte a ti. <laughs> hi, Arvind. Hi, Gita. Arvind, I see that your name is Arvind Arvind. When I was putting my database first and last name, I, 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 I was like, you know, I'll just put Arvind as the last name as well. So I see that you do the same thing. <laughs> Gita, you're muted. You're muted. I can't hear you. 
Buffy, how's it going? You're on mute. Just, just... That's a nice bookshelf in the background. <laughs> <laughs> and the Japanese blinds. Yeah. It's awesome to see you. Thanks for joining. Nice to see you. I have a call that was scheduled for 11.30, so unfortunately I can't stay on for very long. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. I'm glad you're here for even that 30 minutes. Yasu Daphne. Πώς γίνεσαι πιο όμορφη κάθε χρόνο εσύ, Δάφνη μου. Στήλω θα φας, κάτι μας κρύβει. Κοσμά. Hey, Κοσμά. Hey, happy birthday. What time zone are you in? I'm actually in Boston today. Oh, that's awesome. Good. It's good to see you. So, Julia, hey. How can Zoom fit so many people? I feel like I've been saying hello for so long and there's, you know, still have people I haven't seen. So, hell, Eladio, hey. <laughs> Happy birthday. Good to so see glad you guys. you guys are here. Birthday, Manoli. Thank you, thank you. Uh, hey, Bob. Hey, Manoli. Happy birthday. Good to see you. Good to see you, uh, too. The person who says Maria over there looks a little different, although just as young. Who is that person? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My mom is calling from the, from, um, in, uh, wait, where in the world are you? Not Indonesia, but Thailand. Mama, eh, can I click here? Okay. Thailand. Mute. It's Thailand. <laughs> this is my mom in front of technology. Fantastic. <laughs> All right. So I think without further ado, we're going to do, Actually, you know what? Instead of just doing a quick round of introductions, we're going to do uh, introductions plus question one, okay? And it's going to be from the top left in my screen going down. So to remind you the questions, it's going to be two questions. The theme is looking forward, looking back. So looking forward is as my family is turning 100, I'm basically pondering how will I feel at 100 years old? What do I really want to accomplish by then? And I thought, well, the best way to go over my second midlife crisis is to ask my friends what they're, hey, Sogada, I just saw you. <laughs> yeah, to ask my friends, uh, how are you guys taking on the challenge of what do you want to accomplish before 100? And it doesn't need to be 100. Basically, think of it as a 20 year horizon or a 10 year horizon. You know, 100 is a little too far away. By then, you know, who lives, who dies. But uh, in the next 10, 20 years, I, you know, that's sort of the, the, the horizon that I'm thinking of. Maybe as you're turning 65 or 75 or something like that. So um, what I'd love to hear from each of you is number one, looking forward. Hi, Katya. Looking forward, what do you want to accomplish in the next 20 years and how are you going to go about it? Basically, what is the one key idea today that will have the most impact in the next 20 years? And then the question number two is, if you were to go back to your 20-year-old self, not your current year old self, but your 20-year-old self, what will your 100-year-old self or 75-year-old self have as advice for your younger self, okay? So I could do it by screen, but you know what? Why don't we uh, have people who need to leave soon raise their hand first? And I know that Nicole, you have to leave soon. And I know that Safi, you're gonna have to leave soon. So uh, again, just to, re and, and uh, Saman. So there's a little option at the very bottom where you see reactions. Uh, if you click at the very bottom, you can actually, uh, how do we raise your hand? Um, oh, I can't raise my hand because I'm the host, but um, you know, this is clapping. This is thumbs upping. This is loving. And then, uh, so as people are speaking, you can react accordingly. Manolis, the raise hand is in the, is in the participants list. list. Okay, so, perfect. The bottom left of the participants list. Perfect, thank you. So at the bottom left of participants, you can raise your hand and then you can lower your hand. So I see that Martin is raising his hand and he has to leave soon. So um, those who are ready, raise your and, and who have to leave soon, uh, raise your hand first, and then I'm going to call on you. So uh, Nicole, you had uh, asked first, so you go, you get to go first, and then Safi, and then Martin. Go ahead, Nicole. Awesome. <clears throat> so happy birthday, Manolis. I just want to say how amazing you are and how much joy and our friendship brings to Ned and I and our family. So we love you and happy birthday. Thank you, thank you. But uh, uh, Nicole is the most awesome entrepreneur of the year, and she has like the most the fastest growing company. Uh, tell us a little bit about your company and then about what you do and who you are and how we know each other. And then sure. uh, tell us about the one key idea that's going to revolutionize the world. Okay, cool. Um, it all ties in together. So 
So my company is Globalization Partners. We help companies expand internationally without having to set up branch offices or subsidiaries or hire people or uh, deal with any of the legal or, or HR issues before they hire someone in another country. The reason that's important is because normally when a company wants to hire an employee in another country, it's a lot of work to navigate, just huge amounts of bureaucracy. And instead, using our software, they can hire anyone through our global subsidiaries within a couple hours of finding that person. So that ties to my 20 year project, which is the reason I think this is really meaningful in the era of global remote work. And in fact, the pandemic you know, propelled everything forward 10 years is that it really gives people the opportunity all over the world. It's like the democratization of the, of the global workforce. And I think um, my personal interest is in working to eliminate extreme poverty. It's one of the, the uh, 2030 millennial goals. And I just think that um, like the winners in this game are really talented people everywhere in the world. And that when people have access to, to really good jobs, like really bright people in India, really bright people everywhere, instead of just being propelled towards the bottom of the income scale by virtue of where they live, what we're starting to see is companies will pay for world-class talent wherever they live. And so it kind of spreads out the income disparity. So like San Francisco salaries, you know, anywhere in the world, and people can reinvest in their home economies and their home countries instead of only consolidating uh, wealth, power, and prestige around the Silicon Valley and, and Boston and Cambridge and, and places like where many of us have, have gone to study and live. Totally. Um, and okay, and then, sorry, go ahead. And now looking back. Okay, yes, and then looking back, I'd say, you know, my advice has nothing to do with business, but it's really, a, but, it, but it could be applied in anything. I think it's really to just follow your heart. You know, I think there's this inner voice inside all of us that propels us forward to do things that other people would tell us are absolutely crazy, whether it's quitting your job to start a company or breaking up with in a relationship that that seems good, but it just doesn't feel quite right in your heart. Like I believe that your highest self and your soul tells you what to do. I and uh, listening to that is the best advice I would ever give my 20 year old self. I love it. Woo. Thank you. Come on. <laughs> uh, Marina has her hand up. Uh, uh, so um, Marina and then Safi and then Martin. Marina. Yeah, so uh, I just want to say that so resonated with me. Um, um, my articulation of the future isn't quite as clear as yours, but um, I've been doing some work with MIT's REACT program, which helps wait, refugees. Wait, wait, wait. Marina, tell everybody a little bit about you. Marina oh, is sure. like, awesome. So I'm an entrepreneur. I started, uh, I got a master's degree in mechanical engineering from MIT and started a 3D printing business, which was one of the early leaders in 3D printing in the 90s and then sold the business. And since then I've been writing, doing public speaking, some teaching and um, sit on corporate boards. Um, wait, but wait, wait. I I'm gonna make a parenthesis to say that Marina is also one of the strongest supporters of the Greek community. She has launched this uh, MIT entrepreneurship program in Greece. She has brought uh, entrepreneurs from Greece for an annual competition to sort of connect them with all of the know-how of the Boston area. She has been such a proponent of the Hellenic uh, community and network. Hellenic Innovation Network has had a series of lectures uh, during this pandemic. So she's really one of the leaders of the Greek community and it's a true privilege to have you here. So thank you, Marina. Manoli, you're such a great commercial. Wow. Um, yeah, so, uh, but one thing that I, I have this just strong to your point about what's in your heart I have such a strong sense of um, immigrants and refugees in particular because of the burning hunger that they have coming from where they come from. And I, uh, my grandmother was a refugee actually out of Smyrna. Um, that that is a huge contributor of value. And if you look at the data in the United States, refugees outperform immigrants who outperform native born in entrepreneurship. And so I think there's just this huge opportunity to have us look differently at refugees. And so I've been working with this program at MIT, which educates the sort of cream of the crop um, refugees from all over the world in computer science. So that to your point about democratizing the labor force, um, they can contribute and work um, you know, on a computer for a business located absolutely anywhere. So I'm not sure exactly where this is gonna go, but um, it's really 
making me very excited and it's an area that I think um, could contribute a lot of value. Awesome. So now looking back. Oh, I don't, I think it's um, looking to your heart, the same thing, like looking to your heart, really checking in um, at, on a more periodic basis um, as to whether my activities are aligned with what I find interesting. Um, that. So, so basically you're, you're, the way you look back is looking forward. You're basically saying, what should I do to make the future, like how do I adjust the present to make the future a reality basis? Yep. Awesome. Um, I'm starting to have some connection problems, but luckily the recording is uh, over the network. And uh, let's see, I'm gonna just uh, call in from my phone, I guess. Uh, if anybody can hear me, uh, Safi- I'm gonna notice you're coming through for me perfectly. And, yeah, Noel, uh, you're fine. Yeah. We oh, can't hear you, Redmond. Safi, are you still there? Where are you? Oh, cool. Um, so um, this is embarrassing. Safi, are you so, so, so hold on, Safi, are you up next? Whatever Manelis tells me to do, I'll do. Okay, you're up next, go for it. All right, uh, so Safi is an awesome uh, scientist. He's the director of a multi, uh, an enormous company that was basically uh, building drugs for cancer. And then two years ago, he decided to sort of take his vision of the, of the world and how, how innovation works into this book called Loon Shots that has been, you know, number one bestseller in the New York Times. And uh, we were very privileged to host him for uh, his launch of his book in Boston. So uh, he also has a loving, beautiful family and uh, it's been fabulous to have breakfast together. So uh, Safi, take it away. Thanks, Manolis. Uh, if even half of that was true, it would be awesome, but I appreciate it. The, uh, the kind words, and I miss you guys, and I miss your uh, gatherings. They were always, um, they were, they will be. They were, and they will be. Uh, lots of fun. Um, I'm trying to remember the exercise. With, so number with five, it, what is the key idea, one key idea from today that will transform the future in the next 20, 50 years? And then number two, looking back, what key piece of advice would you give your 20-year-old self um, well, I think I, th I can tell you what I'm excited about right now is uh, I have gone into a kind of a cave. I haven't done this in a long time. And you probably remember these days when you stumble across something sort of sometimes accidentally in your research or you're figuring something out. And I stumbled across something which seems to be a very big idea that seems to answer um, these mysteries that people have worked on for a long time. And it's a very unusual way to think about it. It's related to what I wrote about in Loonshots about why systems suddenly change. And I thought a fun example would be of systems suddenly change would be, well, markets, bubbles and crashes, societies, bubbles and crashes. And it turns out markets don't crash in most, in pretty much every theory that's won the Nobel Prize in, you know, no economics. And so I came up with a very different way to think about the behavior of large systems, uh, systems like that, and showed why that explains a bunch of outstanding puzzles. Um, and I think for me, that's been a, a ton of fun over the past year and still some more to go on that. But I think that can help explain a lot of, it's a different way of thinking about the world around us, about how the world around us is uh, is made up of these systems that can suddenly change in a way that you can define much more accurately. And that gives you new way to think about it, new ways to manage it. So Love it. that's and what I'm excited yeah. about right now. Looking back, what's one key piece of advice that you would give your 20 year old self? Buy Apple stock. <laughs> I love it. All right, uh, Stephanie, you are next. Excellent. Well, I'm so excited to be here today and I can't express how much I miss Manolos and the entire family. So hopefully we can all get back together again soon and save for times. Um, I've been fortunate to meet Manolos through a lot of wonderful people. 
And if I think about what excites me most for innovation moving forward. Introduce yourself. Tell us about the amazing stuff that you're doing in the biotech space. Uh, so I work for a, a very big, large Dutch company. Um, and what I'm charged of doing is really expanding our telediagnostic capabilities. So that is looking at how do we remotely enable um, clinical decision support for things like teleradiology, regardless of what provider network that you're part of, um, which is really critical from an access to care. Um, linked to that, I've become really excited about the concept, and this is outside of my current company scope, of proteomics. And proteomics is uh, similar to genetics at the foundational level, but much more detailed and much more real time. And I just think it has so much potential opportunity for folks, more real time diagnostic capability that's much less invasive, doesn't require bone marrow pulls, big CTs, big MRI machines, but also really accelerating precision medicine and therapeutics that are much more tailored to an individual's current state. So I'm really excited about this, this scientific concept of proteomics and where it might lead and see it to be just a bit kind of behind genomics in its current state, but can go much more beyond given the, the real real-time nature of our proteins. I love it. So, so very excited. And hopefully, Miles, we should probably have some like little nerd time about that soon. Looking back? Suckle back. So it's actually really linked to just thinking about people like Monolos. So if I look at my older self, it's really surround yourself with great people and people who always challenge you, who, who make you wanna be a better person and be a better person. And don't waste your time on individuals who bring negativity and pull you back. Wow. Uh, so that's what I would, and I think Manos is a wonderful example of that type of person and individuals that I've really tried to more hone in how I spend my time, of course, with poor family. This is the number one advice I'm following and that's exactly the result of having these people here. Thank you, Stephanie, bye-bye. Martin, you're next. Sure. So um, I have no. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Introduce yourself. Oh, Martin, Martin Leonard. I'm a professor at MIT. Uh, you know, love having all, all of you around. Love having Manolis. Love Arvind. Love Saman. Love all my colleagues, more or less. And well, you know, I, let me let me say that Martin has basically completely changed, transformed the way that I think of computer systems. Instead of basically trying to make something very small and very precise, extremely, you know you know, reliably, he basically says, oh, screw that. Let's just compute almost there. Let's basically do it the way that biology does it. And if I think the engineering world was able to embrace a little bit of ambiguity, a little bit of, you know, I mean, getting the wrong answer every now and then, I think the whole world would be probably a way better place. But anyway, Martin, continue. All right. So for the next 10 to 50 years, I have no specific goals for transforming society. My goals for myself are explore the ideas that I find interesting, work them out, and develop the people who come to me and work with me so that they can be a success in life. That's really what I've been doing as a professor. Okay? Beautiful. And now, go ahead. Looking back? Looking back. Um, number one, the, your body is the foundation of everything you do. Keep yourself healthy. Find a good physical therapist. Find a good massage therapist. That would be my one, one of my advice to my, my 20 year old self. Okay. My brother's a fantastic physical therapist, one of the best in the world. He's made in my life unbelievably better by solving hard problems in my body. Okay. Engineering for humans. Yeah. No, he's, he's unbelievably good at it. Okay. Second, um, in life, to be successful, you have to be lucky. Most people think of luck as something that happens to you. However, getting lucky is a skill. What you do is you put continually find opportunities to put yourself in positions where you can get lucky. Okay. Third, life is an adventure. You don't get the adventure unless you say yes. Every time you have a chance for an adventure, say yes to the adventure. Now, I will, to place these all in context and make something specific and concrete out of it, back when I, in my 20s and 30s, I was spending a lot of time surfing in cold water in San Francisco and Santa Cruz. Okay, so now my advice to myself then would be buy a better wetsuit that keeps you warmer, ride a board with more volume that, 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 that lets you catch more waves because those, what those two things let you do is they help you get lucky. Catching a wave is a large part of, 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 of luck because the wave, ha you, the wave has to be there and you got to get the wave. So a wetsuit lets you stay out in the water longer and you're exposed to more, the opportunity to find more waves. A surfboard with bigger volume lets you 
catch waves more easily, and then you get more waves. So that's a simplistic but concrete example of how you learn, uh, of, of how getting lucky is a skill. Getting lucky is probably one of the most important aspects of having a successful life. Learn how to get lucky. Uh, you may have said this already because my connection was terrible, but uh, when they asked Napoleon if he preferred the brave generals or the cautious generals, his answer was, I prefer the lucky generals. Yep. <laughs> right. Because basically, beat luck. Exactly. When you when you know how to get yourself in positions that favor the you know lucky, then uh, you win. All right, Christian. I see you have a baby in your arms. So uh, if my video that's delayed by at least 15, 20 seconds now is correct. So uh, Christian, can you please introduce yourself? Uh, tell us a little bit about your background, what you do, and then the key idea. Uh, that will change the world. And then looking back, one key piece of advice. Sorry, I was away from the, from the, did you say me? Yes, yes. Oh, okay. So let's pick someone else. We'll be ready next. <laughs> okay, sounds good. So uh, Saman, you are next. Okay, yeah, so yeah. one thing that's really strange here is Manolis's birthday is on daylight saving time. So that means every year I think he's gaining one more one more hour of his life. So I think I think it's interesting to figure this one out. In 100 years, he might be like one more day younger than everybody else. The a know. little known secret is that I observe daylight savings three times a day. So... <laughs> <in every> <laughs> <day>. <laughs> so I'm also a colleague of Manoli uh, at uh, uh, MIT. Uh, it's really fun to be MIT. It's like, it, it's a lifelong thing. So all of us are just basically family. You can't get rid of family. You can't get rid of people at MIT either. So, so it has this kind of a, a, a family notion of what's going on. So, so going, uh, basically looking forward. So being a control fleet myself, I always try to figure out how do I change the world? What should I do in myself to basically have the biggest impact? But recently I have come to this realization. In computer science, there's this saying thing, every problem can be solved by one level of indirection. What I realize is biggest impact I have is by example, by training and, and by motivating people. It's not like what I do. If I, if, I, if I got my students, people around me, they are motivated, they are following that, I think I will have the biggest impact. So that's an interesting uh, realization to say it's not the, what I do, it's what, how, how I trade, who people around me. Yeah. So I, 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 I think going forward, I think I'm going to focus a lot more on that than, than exactly the uh, things I do. So going backwards, what I would say is there's nothing called adversity. Everything is opportunity. Okay. If you have lemons, make lemonade. So for example, this pandemic, I'm so happy. I don't want to leave my house. I'm, I'm very worried that, that everybody is going to be vaccinated and they will ask me to come back to office. I mean, I have a 30 second commute. I only need to put a shirt. I am in right now shorts. I, I don't know where shoes. I, have, I don't even know where my shoes are at this point in that. And if I want to talk to anybody in the world, it's, it's the 10 seconds of my meetings every day in Zoom. It's like I'm talking to everybody everywhere. And, and I'm, I think I have been more productive in the last year than any time in my life. So idea there is don't think of these things as adversarial things and, and mourn about it. Embrace it. And, and actually, it might be better. Totally awesome. Uh, Christian, you are up. And you have an amazing microphone there. Well, we're, we're getting ready for the, the podcast. Come on, Eleanor, come join us. So um, our observation is that uh, we've been seduced by social networks and social media, thinking that they make us more social. And actually, they make us more depressed and feeling more distant from fellow humans. <laughs> And I contrast the excitement we've had about new social media like Facebook, like Twitter, like even Clubhouse most recently, probably half of you are on Clubhouse, where at first it seems so appealing, but it's really just hacking our evolutionary need to be connected. 
and I compare those experiences to the experience of being in Manolis and Lucille's living room and in community with all of you. Yes, Ceci, right? <laughs> and, and the difference in experience of humans spending, choosing to be together, not through an algorithm, but both through our hearts and spending time face to face in person rather than by sharing photographs of a vacation. Beautiful. And it's I hope that when, when I'm a hundred, I'll, we, we will, we hope when we're a hundred, we'll have played a small role in bringing humans together through community and through choice and through hearts. Um, and then the advice of my hundred year old self to my 20 year old self, when I was 20 years old, I was in the middle of one of the periods, the happiest three years of my life, my time in university in England. And the second happiest time in my life was the time I was at university at Manolis's university in America. And at that age, I thought, oh, I have to leave academia. I have to leave school really and be successful. And what I would tell myself is don't be ashamed of learning and it's okay it would be okay to spend your whole life in school and your whole life as a learner if you are so lucky this is awesome thank you christian is this a good time for natalia to go as well or do you want to maybe... that was our that was our uh, family answer no 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 natalia don't get out so easily <laughs> natalia is an awesome uh, space engineer so she basically designs uh, rockets that propulse themselves through ions and le electricity rather than burning fuel and sort of ejecting it uh, out the back, which makes them extremely more effic efficient. If you want to go from uh, you know Mars to Jupiter, you don't want a big rocket booster. You want an ion uh, propeller. So uh, Natalia, can you tell us about uh, some of your uh, advice to yourself and then um, key idea going forward? Great. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll start, yeah, advice to myself. Um, I, you know, started out being very technical, um, thinking, you know, I could logic and reason my way into every answer. And as I've been running a business and working with a lot of humans, um, I think, you know, my advice um, that would have let me shortcut a lot of the, the blood, sweat, and tears of of the past 15 years would be um, that connecting, you know, I'll piggyback off of Christian, but connecting with, with people um, in a like genuine way and building trust and strong relationships is, you know, one of the most important things. And I think going forward as, as we, you know, um, humans become a little bit more, um, you know, go from knowledge workers to, to whatever comes next. And um, our ability to connect with one another in, in really deep, meaningful ways will be one of the most important things we can do. Um, and that's, you know, not how I was thinking in my 20s. And um, that's awesome. So that's what I would tell Thank myself. you so much, Natalia. All right. Next up, we have Eladio. Eladio is an award winning photographer and videographer. He basically, his, uh, his film uh, called The Jewel of the Pacific about San Diego won an award. And when I wanted to buy a drone, I basically just emailed Eladio and I said, what drone should I get? And he, he basically said, DJI Mavic Air. And ever since people ask me, what drone should I get? Well, I'm like, well, Eladio told me to get this one. So I think you should just get this one. So that's <laughs> awesome. was a classmate of mine in uh, class of 99 at MIT. And uh, you, you're next. Yeah, so uh, it's, thanks for the kind words. Uh, yes, we were classmates, 99, electrical engineering, and we were also international students both. So we also worked uh, together there. So look, looking forward, uh, it probably has, it has to do with uh, the career change that I'm going through. Uh, after being electrical engineer for 18 years, decided to become a filmmaker. And now I'm thinking, what kind of filmmaker do I want to be? And I'm focusing this in the last, during the pandemic, I want to create uplifting documentaries. And, and the story here is like, there's so many negative news. Yes, definitely. <laughs> there's so many like negative news everywhere, but there's so many good stories that are not told for some reason. 
So, um, and some of the stories are told in podcasts or other ways, but I want to create a cinematic experience of these stories so that people can be motivated and inspired to do, to do uh, great things. I love it. Looking, looking, back. looking back, I think you have to uh, leave uh, space for randomicity. And wow. the reason for this is as I'm being putting together my team for filmmaking, all of these people I've come in touch by random accidents. Like I, I was talking with somebody and then some, some connection came or I went to an event that randomly decided to go there and a connection came from those places. So as an engineer, it's, it's really good. It's really easy to go from A to C, like create the whole plan. But if you leave some time for randomicity to actually do its thing, some people call it the universe or, or something like that, but uh, it works actually. I love it. Thank you for the advice. Swagata, you are next. One of the key drivers of the, uh, of the uh, sort of engineering and entrepreneurship community here in Boston. Take it away. <laughs> Thank you, Manolis. Um, as you know, I have an IoT device startup that create, um, measures invisible threats or monitors invisible threats in the home. So I love that you wait every year that you do this and put, put, put us all in a room together to have these thoughts. I've been thinking a lot about these things and just hearing other people speak about them is, is so moving. The, uh, Marina mentioned refugees and I think Christian mentioned um, connectivity on social media. So our company tries to be prescriptive and predictive in what we do without being addictive because I saw the social dilemma and it blew my mind. So I do think that this is basically a slot machine <laughs> and is trying to keep us hooked and I don't like it. So I want the future of connectivity to be prescriptive and predictive and help be facilitating us, not the other way around. Beautiful. What I would tell my 20 year old self is to talk more to my grandparents and talk more to um, particularly the women in my family and hear their stories because we are standing on the backs of giants. And my family also was refugees. My father's side of the family came from Bangladesh into India. And when people were saying bad things about refugees the past four years, I was thinking refugees are some of the smartest, brightest, most resilient and creative people on earth to be able to get out of such a terrible situation and be survivors and get over to the other side. So these are the best of the best and to have people disparaging them was very difficult to hear these past few years. And what I wanna see in the future and what I'd tell my hundred year old self is to look for, you know, question everything and have those types of, you know, just don't take things for granted and assumption, you know, question every assumption and also, um, focus more on the planet and on the earth. So my boyfriend's really into no-till gardening. So basically all of those beautiful manicured farming areas that we see are actually very damaging to the planet from a carbon perspective. So no-till actually going back to the earth and, and having multiple plants in place in, the, in those, gar um, in those um, areas is better or farming techniques are better. So um, I hope that we find ways to be gentler to the planet and not just, you know, by questioning the status quo. I love it. Thank you so much. Uh, Sohail, you are next. So Sohail is a professor in uh, the field of uh, computer science, algorithms, machine learning, and computational biology. He's an alum from MIT, and he is my Persian brother. Thank you so much, Manolis, and happy birthday. Really, thank you, thank really you. nice, uh, you know, seeing you. Um, you know, and thanks for the introduction. Yeah, so I have been working on uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, especially focusing on you know, mathematics and foundations behind these systems. So I just wanna like, you know, you know, give you like my two cents about like how the AI you know, world changes. Uh, recently, we have been like mainly focused on reliability of these systems. Like I would say like 80, 90% of the community we are focused on like make sure that the performance of these AI systems and AI models are you know reliable you know with respect to different you know changes in the environment you know changes in the observations etc cetera, etc. Cetera. But I think in the you know next 10 20 years, reasoning is also going to become very important. So we want to make sure that we have you know basically some understanding of the logic behind these predictions. And maybe even like, you know, further away, if we want to deploy these AI systems in, you know, heavily human interactions, we want to make sure they also understand emotions, right? So if you, you know, and they're open to emotions and they can also, you know, express emotions. 
So we have started to think about some of these directions. It is extremely interesting, but also challenging because how we can mathematically formulate, you know, some of these, you know, problems in terms of, you know, reasonings and logic, even for humans, these problems are like, you know, kind of vague. So these are kind of like the problems that we are, you know, currently thinking about. Totally awesome. Thank you, Sohail. Another fellow Persian, Ramis, uh, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and Parisa. Hello, happy birthday, Manolis. Uh, it's great to see you. And uh, we've wanted to see you guys in person for a while, but you know, you know. Uh, yeah, so Teresa, do you want to, since uh, time is... Sure. Uh, hi, Manolis, and hi, everybody. Happy birthday again. Uh, and Ramis is right. I wish everything was okay and we could meet in person, but this is the word problem. So I want to be very quick. Uh, I'm, I'm, although like, you know, I'm working in tech, but the, one of the things that I've been recently thinking about, especially from the beginning of the pandemic, is like, you know, during the pandemic, we all witness uh, like, you know, a gap between poor and rich people, especially among kids. I'm originally from Iran. And uh, like, you know, I witnessed that a lot of kids, because uh, like, you know, lack of technology, they didn't have enough resource and access to uh, get the right education. So what I'm envisioning is like, you know, by using technology and resources that we have on our hands, we build up a platform and infrastructure for all, not just kids, but every person uh, in the world to get access to the right resources. Uh, like, you know, I'm the, maybe it's a little too big, but I, I'm envisioning a world without poverty and without people who don't have uh, the right access to what they need. And the advice that I would give to myself, uh, to my 20 year old is uh, uh, to uh, probably take my uh, time a little, like, use my time a little uh, wiser and, uh, and, and probably like, you know, uh, spend more time on things that I care more. Love All it. Right. Thank you. Ramis. All right. So introduce myself. Yeah, well, I'm a, I'm a mathematical physicist. I work on quantum computing right now. Um, I'm at this MIT IBM Center and uh, I'm at IBM Research. So what am I excited about? So what I would be very excited about um, the, in the near future, you know, till 100. First of all, that's very optimistic. I really hope as a human race we'll make it to the to the time that I'm hundred. Uh, so I would for, for for one thing I would love to see that. Optimistic <laughs> and, um, coming from me? Come on. <laughs> no, well, I mean coming from 2020. <laughs> um, but yeah, so you know I'm very excited about the future of computing at large. And in particular, I mean the field I work on is quantum computing. And one promise of quantum computing is you know violation of the so-called extended church Turing thesis, which says that there are certain things that you can compute with a quantum computer that in nature would take you exponential time to do. So yeah. would, it would enable us to do, say, simulation of quantum matter. And that is a stepping stone into like bridging the gap between the quantum and the classical world. And a phenomenon I'm very fascinated by is the so-called emergence in complex systems. So if we could close this gap better, it'll help us understand better um, the many interacting systems. And through that, what is really behind it that excites me is better understanding of um, human brain, which is a highly interacting system. And for example, I would love to see a more serious and qualitative study of um, you know, topography of human potentials. If you, if you study, if you study like there's, there's an essay I can recommend called Energies of Men by William James. And it's, it's fascinating. Like people throughout history have been able to tap into something way beyond themselves under very extreme circumstances. Yeah. And understanding these things are very much in the dark. And wow. I believe it will help us like be better understanding of that will help us um, enrich ourselves. Yeah. As, a, as a human race. I have to say that I'm constantly putting myself in that situation by doing everything at the last minute. In the last yeah. five minutes before lecture, ideas clear out. The world just opens up. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? And the advice, I mean, yeah, that's true. Like there are other, like people, their experiences like warriors who were wounded and um, under very extreme circumstances with very little food and sleep fought for like 30 days straight. Yeah. 
And these are things that you cannot just do by willing. You know, it's just amazing. Some of the, I mean, I could talk more about it, but I want to be respectful of time. We can talk maybe some other time if you like. All right, looking back. Looking back, um, I would, uh, I would, I would basically trust my intuition more. It's always easier looking back and saying these things, but I feel like many of the decisions that I made or paths I put myself into yeah. were really in the right track, but I could have maybe had, you know, more firmer and longer strides and with less doubt, and that would have given oh. me more time. And I would definitely mine some Bitcoins. So. <laughs> Beautiful. Return. All right. So Daphne, Lochan, uh, and Arvind. Uh, Daphne. Kronia Supolama Nolimo. Um, hello, I'm Daphne Politis. I'm uh, I'm an urban planner. I'm an alum of MIT. I uh, work with uh, municipalities um, on a number of planning efforts, but a lot of it is about um, understanding the present and a little bit about anticipating the future. Um, and in order to do that, always looking at the past. So if I'm going to look at my younger self, but not from 100, because that would assume that I could predict the events that will shape my reflections, uh -huh. which I cannot do in, as this year has proven to us. So I can give my younger self advice from this point, And that would be to think less of what others thought about me and what I was doing, and also to believe in destiny, but to know that I could whisper in her ear wow. and steer the direction. I love it. In terms it. of looking forward, I would say that I used to suffer from FOMO, fear of missing out. Yeah. And now I have uh, recently become aware that I am suffering from phone, fear of normal. As we think about looking, you know, s s going back. So I have been asking myself a series of questions. What have I learned most about myself? What surprised me about myself? What do I miss most? So that I can shape the new normal. So it's not about going back. It's about moving forward and taking the lessons that we've learned. And if we apply that to society, I think the last year, and especially in my work, the last year, um, what the pandemic has both exacerbated and exposed um, in terms of inequalities, in terms of the rotten nature of this infrastructure, especially of the, this country's uh, support for the underserved, um, but also some of the, the things that have been positive, the, the reduction in commuting, the working from home, the impact on the new workplace and the office uh, relations, the use of public space and civic space. But if we combine the pandemic with the, with the murder of George Floyd, I think that we can finally center equity. Wow. And that's what I look forward to doing. Awesome, thank you, Daphne. All right, uh, now the next two are gonna be my uh, you know, uh, adoptive parents. Uh, <laughs> both Trini and Lauchen and Gita and Arvin have basically uh, embraced our family, me, me and Lucille and our, our kids as their own children and grandkids. So uh, it's, it's fabulous to hear from both of you and to have you both back to back with your hands up. So Lauchen and Trini first. Great. Um, so happy birthday, Manolis. Um, and I only see 44. I'm still looking for the other 56. Uh, they're probably somewhere <laughs> in different edges of your screen. So happy birthday to all the rest of the 56 as well. The other 56 are roaming around the house. I, I, uh, that's what I would have guessed. <laughs> um, so yeah, and you know, I, I'm not sure I consider myself your parent because uh, I think I'm not that far off, <laughs> not yet. But, uh, but, but you, yeah, you have still adopted, adopted us. Yeah, men, maybe, mentor, yeah, certainly. maybe aunt and uncle to our kids. Let's put yeah, it yeah, 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 I, I like that. Um, so yeah, so uh, I'm Lo Chen. I worked as a um, software engineer for many years. Ten years ago, I gave that up to do more things like education. And uh, you know, I talk about I I I, work, I volunteer at an Indian school, uh, about 500 kids, and we we do stuff there. So one of the things that's happened over this year, the pandemic year is, I've gotten pretty good at editing videos. I have to do it for um, both TikTok. for, you know, personal celebrations, you know, I put together little videos, clips, and for my school, we edit these things. 
Um, but so now looking forward is how do I take that? And when we go back, when we're all meeting in person, let's say a celebration like this, how can you take a video clip of someone who's not there and make it part of the interactive experience? So that's my idea. And that's what I want to look at. And, and I'm interested, how do you make family celebrations across the globe feel like everyone's in a room together, Very even if nice. they're not? And you know, it's just you, we have technology that we've learned over this year. And going forward, we want to make that, how can you make these video clips in a classroom be a part of the interactive experience in a celebration be a part of an interactive experience looking back my 20 year old self i wish and this is advice to all 20 year olds learn hard skills i wish i had learned how to play an instrument i wish i had learned you know several new languages i wish i had learned how to uh, rollerblade it's much easier doing this at 20 than now soft skills you can pick up anytime hard skills do it when you're 20 and you know <laughs> it'll take you far. Great advice, Srini. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, happy 100th birthday to my others, Lucille, Jonathan, uh, Cleo, and Elora. Thank you, thank I'm you. a professor at MIT. I've been at MIT, you know, significantly longer than Manolis has, but not as long as Arvin. <laughs> uh, as so, a parenthesis, Srini is one of the fastest and smartest people I know. He was my department head. He put my tenure case through when I was, you know, up for up for tenure. So I owe him basically my job in many ways. Oh, and, that uh, is not true. <laughs> won many, many accolades uh, for, you know, top papers in so many conferences. But anyway, go ahead. Um, so uh, I'm going to start with uh, the second question. It's always an easier question, I think, uh, for some reason for me looking back. So I would do three things. When I was 20, I would go find the seven-year-old Manolis Cambuselas and say hi. Say, I do remember. Uh, um, uh, and, uh, and then I would say, uh, be patient, man. I mean, you know, you're going to have uh, hopefully a long life. Well, you know, I guess, you know, 37 more years, I guess, at least. Uh, um, and uh, be patient. Uh, it's like Lochin said, you know, learn, uh, spend time learning. You know, you don't have to spend time doing, you know, uh, you can spend time learning. Wow. And oh. I would I would learn the hardest skill of all, which is mathematics. I would learn more mathematics. And the reason I say that is because, and I do want to do that. That's actually a segue to uh, what I'd like to do uh, more of. I have a, a daughter who just got a PhD in mathematics, pure mathematics so from um, Stanford. I don't understand her thesis at all. Um, I have another daughter who's uh, starting her PhD in, a, uh, well, I guess the nine months into her PhD in applied uh, crypto oh, sorry, cryptography uh, in uh, uh, theoretical cryptography at MIT. And I'd like to understand her thesis. So uh, I, I want to find beautiful things in, uh, in the world uh, and more specifically uh, mathematics. So. I have to say that I was privileged to host uh, your daughter in my lab. And I have a co-authored paper with a uh, Devadas, but neither of you two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks for mentoring her. Of so. course. Thank you for you know supporting my group in all in all ways. Uh, Arvin and Gita, who wants to go first? I'll go first. <laughs> of course. So um, happy birthday, Manolis. Thank you, Gita. It's lovely to have seen you from when you were in love, <laughs> wandering <laughs> around the monuments in Delhi with your really beloved Lucille. <laughs> Manolis came to India uh, for our son's wedding 12 years ago and we saw him, they both came and they were totally in love and we were hoping they'll get married and not only did they get married, they have lovely three children and we are their grandparents. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so so, so for the parenthesis here, the reason why Lucille only stepped in momentarily is because this morning the kids had tennis, ballet, oh. Greek school, <laughs> she's been on the phone, but shuttling back and forth. <laughs> oh, well, so I turn to Shakespeare to say, those friends thou hast and their adoption tried, grapple them to thy soul with hoops of steel. Wow. So that's what I believe in. And when I was 20, it was true. That's when I first heard these lines. And I still think so. The friends are some of the most important Beautiful. in our lives. And we're very happy to have all these friends. Uh, many people who we spend more time with, but you know, new friends to form. And um, well, one of the things I would say if I, when I was 
20, I should have taken more risks than I did. But here's Arvind who took lots of risks. He <laughs> married me, which is the biggest risk. Been married for 48 years. So his risk work. And he'll tell you about his other risks. When he was a graduate student, he went off to Africa for 10 weeks with no money. He went overland from where? From Minnesota <laughs> to Delhi with a group of people, be their group leader, and they hitchhiked all the way. Wow. So he did that when he was 22 and 23. He took risks. And I think that's one thing I would like people to have, while at the same time remembering how privileged we are to be able to do that, because there are many people who can't. And it'd be nice to remember those people all the time. Beautifully said. All right, Arvind. Thank you, Gita. Hi, Manoli. Happy birthday to you, Lucille, and everyone in your family. It's really <laughs> a great gathering here. It's also good to see some old friends. I've seen Scott and Dana, whom I haven't seen in ages. So <laughs> hi, Scott hi, and Dana. Um, hi. I think uh, uh, looking back uh, is somewhat easier at my age <laughs> because in two years I'll be hitting uh, 75. When I was 50, uh, you know, I was having a very good time. I was quite satisfied with life and my students had presented me a 50 year old bottle of wine and I love uh, drinking wine. So I said, you know, this is good life. But at the same time, it was a little bit of a daunting idea because I strongly felt that half my career was ahead of me. So I was thinking, you know, what will I do for next 25 years? Now I don't think like that anymore because I'm nearing 75, but about future. Uh, it's a mixed message for me. So on one hand, I'm amazed at the rate of change in our field because I never expected this. You know, so I'm just amazed how rapidly computer science is changing that if you don't pay attention, uh, you know, you'll be completely out of it in a decade or something, right? So that's a little bit exciting because there is a lot to learn, which is exciting. The part that is worrisome for me is I absolutely don't do social media. And there are many aspects of computing that I totally ignore. And uh, I feel a little bit of a fraud because of that, because those are some of the biggest economic drivers in our field. Well, that may be so, but I'm not willing to go there. So uh, I, I guess I'll just have to find exciting things outside <laughs> of social media and other stuff. I think we'll just have Gita create an account for you and she'll, 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 she'll control it. <laughs> Very good, Manoli, and uh, best wishes again. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I agree with you. <laughs> I'm not part of any social media. <laughs> All right. The next two are actually going to be classmates of mine from uh, undergrad. And one of them is actually a classmate of mine since birth, because it's my own sister, Maria who uh, is calling in at 11.59 p.m. So the only way that she can still wish me happy birthday is if she starts now. And uh, next is Shuja. So Maria, take it away. Well, happy birthday, Manolis. It's uh, very, I, I'm glad that we live in a time when uh, we now have uh, internet and we can actually all connect throughout the world. This is very exciting to be uh, to be here, to be sharing this time. And uh, yeah, it's still at 59, so happy birthday. And, <laughs> thank you. And it's very exciting. I have to say thank you for, um, thank you for being born. Thank you for being my brother. Thank you for everything you have done for the world and continue to do. And- If you um, hadn't made the path, I would have never been born. So thank you for being born first. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And, um, I, I find that uh, life leads us to ways that we didn't expect. And uh, I, as I'm thinking back, um, you know, in your two questions, what would have told my 20 year old self? Um, I, I, I guess I'm gonna start with what I wanna see for humanity. Can I, so, tell, can I tell your 20 year old self how beautiful she was? And can I tell your 44 year old self how beautiful she is? And stop thinking you. about all the things you missed out on and just wake up and realize that you are still amazing. Thank you. And I, I actually, I, I actually do realize that now. And I'm oh, very, good. Very, Perfect. I, I'm very, very excited because I spent so much time jumping through steps. I forgot to pay attention to where I was. And uh, I always made myself wrong. I always criticized myself. I always found the people who hated me the most, trying to make them like me. And so finally people who loved me and, and 
hang out with them instead. Wow, what an idea, what a concept. Advice. Beautiful, ignore um, the haters, embrace the lovers. <laughs> what a great. And uh, the, um, the one thing that uh, I, my, my, my path was very interesting, right? Three degrees from MIT and then I end up in a wheelchair. So I had to rediscover life. I, I, I literally had to learn how to walk again, how, how to speak again. And that led me to understand energy in a very deep way. I, I became a master of energy to the point where I literally worked as a healer and as a psychic, I'm not joking. Uh, that was part of my career path. Like, <laughs> and uh, when, when I did that, I saw that there was, it, it's not one or the other, it's both. So in the last few years, I've kind of brought my career and, and my path to, to, to really embrace my side of engineering, my side of business with the side of energy, because there, there's two, you know, like the Chinese have like this beautiful yin yang simple, like there's yin and yang in the world. There's the male and female energy, there's the flow and the pushing energy. And both are valid, both have specific needs. And, uh, and now my, my work is really my path and it's also everything I do is, is really understanding how does flow work? How can we increase things like productivity or, you know, or um, interactions with humans or, you know, company, uh, company performance through the flow, through energy, things that uh, now are starting to be more embraced in business. Um, there was a time where everybody thought I was crazy, but, uh, but now it's starting to be part of what people understand. And the shift of consciousness, the shift of understanding is not just for me, but it's for everyone. I believe that love is the answer. I know like the Beatles said it best uh, in the 60s when the first had, uh, when first half having television, but we spend so much time disconnected. We spend so much time far away from each other when we are right here, we're all one. We're all united in this incredible universe that we call the earth for now. This is like the, the spaceship earth that we live in. And uh, uh, just an idea, just an idea, something that I teach people is how to connect with the heart. So imagine that there's no space and no time. This is, this is all kind of relative. And imagine that every one of us in this room is together in this moment. And and give each other like a heart bridge. That's what I call them. So imagine that there's a bridge between your heart and my heart and everyone else's heart and feel the connection. Isn't that an amazing beautiful. feeling? Thank you, Maria. This is beautiful. All right, next, Shuja Keen, classmate of mine from uh, MIT class of 99, fellow International Students Association uh, member and uh, very active at that and then president of the MIT Club of Northern California. So Shuja, are you still there? Hey, Manolis, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm not on video. I'm uh, actually moving today, so uh, apologies for that. So I'm not connected on the phone. And I'm so glad in, I dialed in. Full disclosure, Shuja in person is way more handsome than even the very handsome picture he has up. <laughs> no, 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 it's, uh, I've lost all the hair. Um, but Manolis, you know, really, really happy birthday. You were the, one of the first people I met when I landed at MIT, along with Maria, actually. And uh, I mean, this is <laughs> 1995 or something like that, right? August 95. So cool. wow. Yeah. It's a, wow. Long, long time. So, um, and, you know, you've always had this knack of getting people together right from like, international orientation back in, you know, on a, on a, on a cruise ship in, in, you know, in the Boston Bay back in things. So over the last 30, 25 odd years, I've experienced so many of, you know, the, 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 the events you've hosted and people you've brought together. So really, really appreciate what you do there. Um, just going through the task list, uh, you know, just a quick background. I was, uh, you know, uh, class of 99 at MIT. That's how I got to know Manolis. Um, I ended up sort of taking a, uh, an entrepreneurial and an investor kind of career path. Uh, so, um, you know, and uh, I live in the Bay Area. Um, reflecting on the question. one of the most successful investors. He has his own fund. He has so many different companies that he has, you know, helped support, create, sell. I mean, just incredibly successful at that. Well, I don't know, but I mean, we're trying, right? So I think yeah. like, um, you know, just reflecting back on the questions you're saying, like, look, I mean, I think if you think about it, 
the first 25 years we spent learning, yeah. right? Learning how to walk, learning how to do math, learning how to sort of, you know, program and so on and so forth. The next 25 years were kind of like honing and perfecting our craft, right? Becoming the top of our game. And as I reflect, like, look, where, where are we headed in the next 50 years, getting to 100? Um, you know, for me, I think a lot of folks have already mentioned it. So it's kind of like, you know, resonated. But for me, it's like three things, right? Like, so, you know, how I think about it is, you know, how do I leverage and apply the skills, the resources, the social, political, financial capital you've accumulated to make a, a dent in the universe, right? Like, so for me, how do I apply that? Like, so the one leading principle has been kind of like, how do I create opportunities to learn and help, right? And that's for me as well as for others, right? So given that there's a very finite time we have left, how do we be more deliberate about applying our, like, you know, a, 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 some sort of a rubric to like say, okay, I have this finite time, where do I allocate it? If I'm learning or if I'm helping? And if it's not that, then maybe it's not gonna, the best use of the, the finite time. I love um, it. So, so that's one. I think the second point is a little bit, you know, as I reflect back, you know, my grandparents were refugees from India to Pakistan and both sides of it, my uh, father's side and my mother's side and same with my wife's side, right? Like uh, her, her, par her grandparents were refugees from India to Bangladesh. And then when I look at the next generation, my, my parents, my father was, a, a, again, like it was part of that, you know, he immigrated from India to Pakistan. My mom actually ended up immigrating from Bangladesh to U.S. via Pakistan. And my wife's parents, same thing. They immigrated from Bangladesh to Pakistan and then eventually to the U.S. And, you know, our, like my generation was the first one in our kind of family where there hasn't been any like refugee type of situation where you haven't had to like escape because you're forced to escape from an area. And then when I think about my children and that goes to the next 50 years, it's like they have a very cushy life, right? So, and I think part of our, you know, reason why we, there's a certain level of drive and hunger and ambition comes from adversity. And while we all want the best for our children from a safety net perspective, but how do you create adversity which helps them with keeping their hunger and ambition alive, right? And that's not just, you know, and it's a flip side of, I think uh, somebody, somebody had mentioned about creating opportunities for refugees. And I think that's an equally important thing to do but like also how do you like sort of drive that more personally at, at, the, at the home level for, for our own children? Yeah. And then the, so, and then the third thing is like, how do you create a platform to create a better world, right? Like, so when I think about, you know, what we have, you know, I've managed to do as part of a founding team, as Manolo said, like of a, you know, um, of an investor group today, when I reflect back, uh, we've created close to about 35,000 jobs in countries like Nicaragua, Philippines, Jamaica, and Pakistan. And these jobs did not exist. And those are regions of the world where weren't the most popular destinations to, um, for foreign direct investment. And it just helped us like, impact so many lives. So how do you continue to leverage your skills to, to do that, right? I have, I'm also part of a, another sort of fund called Mentors Fund and uh, where uh, we write like early stage checks for in, in, you know, in, in, in early stage companies. But in, when I look back at our portfolio right now, 30% of our founders are women and over 55% of our founders are underrepresented minorities, right? And those, and that was kind of like, you know, and I just like did that like uh, uh, a week and a half ago as we're looking at our overall fund performance. And when I looked at that statistic, and I was like, oh my God, that's just like mind blowing. And it wasn't like, we didn't consciously say that we are going to allocate a third of our capital towards like women founders. It just happened because we found like really amazing founders. So, and it's not that difficult, right? I mean, if you look at the overall industry average, like venture capital only like puts in like 2% or 3% of it into women founded companies. So that's like a 10X improvement there. 
But if we were a little bit more deliberate about it, right? About backing women, backing underrepresented minorities, backing other fragile groups, you can have a much greater impact, right? So I think those are three things I think about as I so look forward in, you know, in the next 50 years. And what do I tell my 25 year old self? I think, and this is a quote which comes, you know, I, you know a lot of people, I mean, when you look at the attribution of it, it goes to so many different sources. So rather than sort of attribute to a particular source, I think the quotes go somewhere like this. Like it's, it basically says like, what's meant for you will never miss you. And what missed you was never meant for you. Wow. Wow. Right. And I think, you know, it goes back to, I think, uh, right. Wow. So what's meant for you will never miss you. Yeah. And what missed you was never meant for you. I love it. So I think it goes back to, I think, uh, I forget. I, I, I'm sorry. I was just like, uh, um, somebody had used this metaphor of like, you know, making sure you create your own luck and making sure you catch the right wave and create yeah. the luck. And after you've done all of that stuff, that's when you like go in with, yes, I've done my best. Now, if it's meant for me, I'll get it. If it's not, then salavi, right? So <laughs> I think that's what, you know, Thank I you. tell Thank my 25-year-old yeah. self. And the second thing would be, I, I tell myself, like, go get a hard skill at MIT. I ended up studying <laughs> finance at MIT and not computer science. So, but well, you yeah. can have an impact in many ways. Thank you, Shuja. That's awesome. Thanks. So uh, next is Ed Boyden. So Ed is another classmate of mine. So class of 99 as well at MIT. And he is one of the most talented and hardworking and successful people I know. And uh, just a true uh, inventor, but also a very good friend. And he has uh, just reshaped the way that we think of many different technologies in the brain and in engineering. And he's a professor at McGovern at Media Lab and in more departments than I know how to name and in more national academies than I, I remember to name. So uh, Ed, take it away. Great, well, happy birthday. And thanks Thank for you. bringing us together uh, in this uh, now emergent tradition that you've, uh, you've created. Uh, maybe the next time we'll have a, uh, I don't know, a special issue of a journal or a book or some, <laughs> some other <laughs> collective effort. Um, and, and thanks for the great questions too. You know, um, what would change the world the next 20 years, you know, and I've been thinking a lot about, uh, you know, biology beyond medicine, right? Usually in biology, we confine ourselves to thinking about uh, understanding biology or healing somebody with a disease, which are very important, don't get me wrong. But I started wondering about what about the societal changes that might emerge? And so, um, and prompted by your, your question, I started thinking a lot, about, a lot about stories. You know, there's an old saying, give me the stories of a land, and you can have the laws. And the meaning of the saying is what we say in our stories, how we tell them, the structure even, is so fundamental to what we celebrate, what we punish, what we do and what we avoid, that those stories translate into the laws and all the other things that we do in everyday life. Wow. Invisibly. Now I think of, there's a, a book, uh, Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari, we, where he argues that money or the idea of the company are stories, fictions that we all tell each other. And I, uh, uh, a small online piece of art just sold for almost $70 million. So these stories can be very powerful. And, and, and so I started thinking a lot about, well, what is a story really? You know, what do, how do we define it biologically? And one thought is, you know, a story is a set of statements, thoughts, events, descriptions that resonate with the human brain. And so I started thinking, you know, we're starting to change the brain, right? We're mapping the brain, we're understanding the brain. And inevitably, that understanding is yielding the desire and even the reality of augmenting the brain. So what does it mean if we change the very substrate that determines what stories are important to us, which then changes everything else? Well, let's consider a couple examples. So right now, a story, I think we all know a good story when we see one, right? Typically, a good story has a small number of characters. There's some kind of conflict. There's some kind of tidy ending, of course. You know, Great stories have great endings, right? And that structure carries over into the rest of life. So Harari gave example like money or the company, but I started wondering if you did a small number of characters in a story, is that one reason why countries have one elected leader for the most part, right? Is it one reason why prizes typically you know, recognize one winner, right? First place in the race, maybe second place, maybe third place. The structure of story spills over into how we celebrate everything in life. So if we flash forward a couple of decades, I wonder if 
brain technology and the changing of the brain might actually change the stories, which then change things in fundamentally unpredictable ways. You know, suppose you can understand somebody else's emotion, would that change empathy itself and change sensations and feelings that can't currently be conveyed? You know, suppose you could hold a hundred characters in your mind rather than just a couple, right? Would now countries have many leaders rather than just one? Or would the idea of a winner, you know, and we even talked about winner take all, would that change? So in summary, I, I think, uh, you know, if a story is something that resonates with the mind and we're about to change the mind, will that change the story, which then changes everything else in fundamentally unpredictable ways? Beautiful. I need to do this every few days because my brain just feels so good every time you speak. It's just lovely. All right. Uh, looking back, what advice would you give your 20 year old self? Um, it's a good question. So I thought a lot less about that question than the first question. <laughs> um, I tend to look back and see, you know, the unpredictable twist as maybe a bit inevitable, maybe because I have a limited imagination, but maybe because this is, again, a human story tend telling tendency. Look back at a moment, which, um, you know, of course, is pure chance. And you think, oh, that is what set me on this path. Or I learned this incredible lesson there. And that's why I'm now doing this thing that, that nobody else is doing. It's pure chance or an accident of fate. And fate and destiny are stories that creep into so many cultures and religions and traditions. So, um, yeah, so it's a much harder question, I think, for me to answer, just because maybe I am trapped in that way of thinking. But I think one thing that uh, uh, maybe is interesting to think about is if, if indeed the structures of stories are changing, and, and I don't really know if this has been, been thought of this way, maybe I'm just ignorant of it, maybe it does mean we should focus more about thinking about the, the structure of how these stories impact our lives. You know, we have very set, you know, we're in science, right? And there's set rituals in science. Here's a PhD, here's tenure, here's, you know, if you start a company, the IPO, you know, there's different ways of, of looking at the story having a plot twist, which is something that then says, yes, you've won, you've got to the next level. And something I, I would maybe would want to think more about is, are there other plot twists we should invent because they could impact people for the better? You know, um, and maybe everything in this list could be questioned, you know, should we take into the PhD program, you know, people who haven't finished college, which we've started to do, but, and, but it's still sort of an exploratory concept. You know, are there ways of, of advancing science in, in, in ways that might be challenging because they violate the story that we kind of grow up with, but, you know, frankly, you're holding science back. Beautiful. So maybe that's something I would have thought more about Thanks at age so 20, much, but, I, but I haven't thought about it. I didn't think about it back then. I love it. Um, all right. So uh, I've been posting this announcement by text, but for those of you who are not receiving the text, if you need to leave soon, raise your hand and I will call upon you first. So we have Stratos and then Naime. So Stratos is uh, the consul of uh, Greece in Boston. And he has not just, you know, stamped passports and signed visas, which is basically his job description, but probably 95% of his time and effort is stuff that he's not actually supposed and uh, asked to do, which is to sort of really bring together the Greek community, organize events about entrepreneurship, about leadership, about uh, just promoting science and technology and connecting the community, not just to Greece, but to the whole world. So Stratos is a very close friend. Uh, our kids are in the same school and it's just wonderful, wonderful to have you in our family and in our, in our lives. So Stratos, take it away. So I'm here with my uh, quality as a fan and admirer of Manolis. Uh, and uh, happy birthday. I, I would like to say that uh, in, in the Greek community, we are all so proud uh, to uh, you know, have Manolis as one of uh, the most prominent members of uh, uh, the Greek scientific and not only community here. Uh, and uh, uh, we, are, we are really you know, so, uh, so proud of your achievements. Uh, I, uh, this year is a special year for Greece. So I'm going to bring a, 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 a Greek flavor. This is what I'm paid for, I, I'm, I, I suppose. Uh, in 2021, we celebrate the bicentennial from the Greek revolution. So in 1821, uh, uh, Greeks uh, revolted against the Ottoman Empire. So I think apart from, you know, the history of a specific nation, this is, a, this is an opportunity to reflect on the ideals that inspired this uh, revolution, the ideals of uh, democracy, freedom, equality of uh, rights, ideals that were inspired both from ancient Greece, but also from the American and the French uh, revolutions, and which in a way paved the way for the emergence of other 
nation states, Italy, uh, Poland, Hungary, and uh, for the advancement of, uh, of the ideals of freedom and democracy, because that was at a time when no social movements and political movements could uh, flourish. And it was the, the first, the first, uh, 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 the first advancement of, uh, of, uh, of a, a national uprising on a democratic platform. So uh, with uh, these uh, thoughts, I pass to another subject which is very dear to me. And, uh, and here is where Manolis and all these groups' uh, contributions can be very crucial. It's how we can uh, combine uh, diplomacy uh, with uh, science and how through scientific uh, uh, diplomacy we can uh, uh, contribute to multilateral cooperation and to the advancement of uh, humanity. This is the main uh, thing I've been dealing with for the last uh, three, four years. And uh, I think there is a lot of uh, space and room to work on this, uh, uh, on this uh, project, bringing together scientists from all over the world because the problems are common. They don't, uh, 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 they don't belong or concern a single nation. So uh, if I go back uh, to you know twenty years, I think I would uh, I would give more uh, I would have given more emphasis on stories, as our friend <laughs> mentioned, on literature, on human skills, uh, on all the things that we often neglect, but they are most uh, more important because they they give this flavor uh, in our life. So uh, with this, I you know I would like to wish happy birthday to Manolis and. Uh, Kalimera to everyone. Thank you, Strato. First of all, All right. Speaking of international collaboration and international scientists uh, and uh, scientific diplomacy, next is Naiman, who's actually a student visiting from Northern Europe, but who's actually Persian and who's here with her husband uh, for for uh, two years now, saying who has just defended her PhD through a Zoom session that in involved people from multiple continents. So. <laughs> Naime, take it away. Yeah, thanks, Manolis. Yeah, happy birthday. It was really great pleasure and opportunity for me to spend that one year in your lab. And uh, still, here I am. I mean, even though it was just three months in person, but the rest of it through Zoom, as you said. But it was really great. Um, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, looking forward, I don't have actually a very clear plan like others. Uh, I'm junior, I would say. <laughs> still, I'm exploring and trying to, uh, you know, to find my own way actually and um, see how life takes me um, but I am trying to read more uh, listen to wiser people and try to connect with people who can help me uh, to be a better me and uh, so uh, like Daphne said I can't um, I don't want to um, be as like 100 years old and uh, talk to my uh, three years old version so I just from now uh, this is stated I would say um, and, you know it's actually it's like uh, back to like what uh, song that I heard yesterday it was released by my favorite band Imagine Dragons and one line it says like she lives her life like hands uh, in a tight gloves uh, and I actually I think pretty much I've lived my life like that so um, I would have tried to, you know, to be more open to people, to ideas, um, to experiences and in life in general. And I would try to step out of my comfort zone as much as I can. Um, yeah. So thank you all <laughs> for sharing your lovely words. Exactly. And thanks, Manolis. All right. Kunal is uh, one of the leaders in cancer uh, genomics, trying to understand cancer epigenomics and circuitry. He's a very close collaborator. He has hosted me over in Houston and uh, has been so gracious through so many different collaborators. He's a mentor to uh, you know, multiple of my students and uh, it's a pleasure to have you here, Kunal. Take it away. Hey, thank you, Manolis. Well, happy birthday. So I'll, I'll say a singing in, in, in Hindi for you. Tum jiyo hajaro saal saal ke din ho So you live, that, that means as you live, thousand years and then every day every day you live in a life of thousand years so oh, um, yeah so uh, definitely uh, just to, I have to leave in like three minutes because my daughter's uh, swimming but uh, uh, so, you know so it, it's been amazing to know you frankly and learning a lot from you and I in fact I see a lot of me in you so you know it, it's great to see uh, obviously what you've done 
uh, my life per se for the two questions has been defined by you know things in uh, my my childhood a lot at 12 or 13 i i lost a close friend from leukemia and her her, her close her last words were to her dad were you know that save me i don't want to i don't want to die and so that's defined my life frankly to be honest and uh, wow. so so all i want to do in next 20 30 or however many many years i live i want to do something that changes uh, that that you know, increases the lives of the cancer patients so they can have a more meaningful life. The second event that has, that has, uh, that actually changed my life was, uh, you know, traveling in these Indian trains where there are a lot of uh, kids without parents who just go and, you know, back type of thing. So the second thing I really want to do is, you know, do something for them as, as uh, in, in near future, hopefully. Uh, those are, those are two things I dare myself to say, do, do things that, you know, change lives and, potentially do Nobel Prize winning work in future. So that's what that's what I'm about. Um, what what I would say to my 20 year old, I was, you know, I was a very shy boy uh, growing in a very small town in India. I come from very humble beginnings. My parents like earned like 20 to 30 dollars a month sort of thing. So the the goals the goal uh, sorry the, so the advice for from here to 20 year would be to say, hey, uh, you know, take more risks learn from wiser people um, and, and believe in yourself as, as uh, I, I think many of other people have said. I consider myself a very average person. So one goal actually to answer the first question for me is to write a book at some point in my life and life of an average kid or, or average man. So uh, to inspire other people. So those are things. And, and the last thing I tell myself, which I think answers both questions. I uh, uh, I'll say two things. One, learn from everyone around you. So a- every single person who you come in touch with has something to give you. Uh, and I think I, I've, I followed that philosophy. I hope I continue to do that. And the second thing I think is just make, uh, you know, everybody else who you come in touch with smile a little more because however many years of lives we have, you know, that's what we lo- live with. And I think that sentiment is absolutely important for given you know how much atrocities are around so it's you, that's with the other hand with that I think. happy birthday again Manolo. it's really a privilege you're an exceptional scientist and an exceptional human being but uh the fact that you think of yourself as average also shows how exceptionally modest you are so thank you thank you thank you enjoy all right Lori is my uh mother from another town i should say so my my the mom that gave birth to me lives uh i mean in greece and is now visiting my sister in thailand but uh Lori is the mom that has basically uh hosted us for every passover and for every you know jewish holiday throughout the year both me and my wife and has seen me grow up from you know what 19 20 years old until now so you know me probably longer than most people on the call, with the exception of a few classmates from undergrad. So uh, her background is actually her own paintings from Bali in Indonesia. And uh, she's just a wonderful human being and a wonderful mother and a wonderful friend to us all. So Lori, take it away. Oh, you're muted, you're muted. Uh, let me try to unmute you. Uh, Yep. Happy birthday, Manolis. Thank you for the kind hey. words. Um, bringing you birthday greetings from me and from Eric uh, and from Jessica, Daniel, and David. Thank you. Uh, they're sorry they can't be here. Uh, we're, as Manola said, we're lucky enough to have known him since he began as Eric's graduate student many, 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 many years ago. Uh, and uh, so lucky to be part of the life of Manolis and Lucille and the kids and the whole family. Um, I, as Manolis said, I'm an artist, um, a painter, and also very involved with um, uh, community and civic engagement, community building and civic engagement and in uh, equity and justice work, uh, which I'm passionate about. Uh, Looking forward. Uh, I'm going to make a parenthesis here to basically say that Lori, we went to visit her just on a spur of a moment on uh, the day before Martin Luther King Day, and her entire house was filled with boxes. Every single year, she organizes the entire Cambridge community for Martin Luther King Day, a day of giving, and she has so many volunteers uh, just, you know, collect and give and spread. 
and she she and her family have worn have won multiple awards for their generosity to the community and for truly sort of bringing our community together. So thank you, Laurie, for all this. Uh, well, thank you. Sort of, but that doesn't happen because unless they sort of, you know, usually more than 3,000 people engage and come to spend the day uh, working uh, in service of others in need in the community. So uh, it's both a, t a large team of people that volunteer to make it happen and then the 3,000 more people that come to do it, uh, including this year where thousands came and participated virtually so that we were able to, uh, you know, collect and deliver 804 bags of groceries to 11 food pantries and make uh, 3,500 Valentines for um, isolated elders and uh, veterans and homeless adults. Um, in the community and about uh, close to 600 fleece scarves and blankets um, for homeless children, teens and adults. So, but it's all because people come and do it. And so I think actually what, you know, my, these relate to my looking forward and looking back. My looking forward is, you know, think about what you personally can do to make your community more equitable. How can you personally fight for equity? in your community and in the, the individuals that you come in contact with. Whether it's the people that you work with, people that you interact with in stores, uh, people that you see on the street, what think about um, what you can do um, to make a difference in the fight for equity. And looking back, I'd say um, be kind. Uh, be proximate, listen deeply, be engaged in your community, letting a 20 year old self know that you can make a difference as an individual and that you should figure out how to use your power. And that's, I guess, both a looking back and a looking forward that as individuals, um, particularly if we're lucky enough to have the privileges of um, either our skin color or our uh, financial means or where we live, that we should use that privilege as power to create a more equitable community. Thank you, Laurie. Happy, wow, wow, happy wow. birthday. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next, from one advisor to the other advisor. So Bonnie Berger is my academic mom. So uh, along with Eric Lander, supposed to provide my PhD thesis. Uh, earning the best PhD thesis in computer science at MIT award, uh, which again is one of dozens of awards that her students have earned. She has supervised uh, some of the most prolific professors in computational biology in the field. She's one of the youngest tenure professors uh, at MIT and one of the most, uh, one whose, fam whose pedigree is uh, truly the most impactful across the field of computational biology. And I, I am one of many, many, many. So Bonnie is one of the smartest and one of the most humble people I know. And uh, it's really a privilege to have you here, Bonnie. So take it away. Wow, um, Manoli. So I too have known you since you were 19 years old when you came into my lab with tons of energy. And I'm absolutely sure that energy will carry you to 100 and well <laughs> past 100. Happy, happy birthday. You, I thought you would, but I'm glad to see you've had an unbelievable career and are still having an unbelievable career. And the impact you've had on students, the field, everybody around you has been fantastic. And um, I'd love to see you with your kids. That's one of the things that I hope you learn from me. Take, off, take the time off, looking back you're on, to your 20 year old self. Take the time off, oh, they're so gorgeous. And so is Lucille, I love her too. <laughs> anyway, take the time off to really spend quality time with your kids. Your career can take a break. It's not gonna interfere with your career. You're still going to do as anything you wanted to do. Just not everything at the same time. 
And that's especially true for women, I like to say, but Manoli uh, has taken that to heart with Lucille. And that is, that is the advice I give most. And love and enjoy your interactions with your students because in the end, that plus your science is going to be the most fulfilling. In, in terms of um, the next 20 years, I've been looking very much at um, viral escape. Are these strains that we're seeing going to escape the vaccines and antibodies that we make in our bodies? And we recently had a science paper in January and we've noticed that these regions on influenza, HIV, on the spike proteins of these or on the surface proteins of these and COVID all have regions of depletion for escape. And influenza, for instance, we don't have a universal vaccine for that. HIV, we don't even have a vaccine for that. And, and so my hope is, is that we can target these regions that are less likely to escape. And when these classes of viruses come along, of which there are actually not too many of them, we can target those regions and prevent them from spreading in the way that we've observed in the last year. Another idea I have for short term is, is to have kind of cassettes of regions that we've predicted to highly escape um, antibody, antigenesis. And I'm hoping that we could have these cassettes for these regions, and we're talking to the CDC right now, and they're using our code for prediction to just sub in when strains come along for boosters for these viruses, for new, you know, for new vaccines. And that is one thing I'm really looking forward to working on more. And I think I've covered my looking back before my looking back 20 years. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. And my last thing is publish any idea, even if you think it's dumb at the time, because I've had some that have like made people's careers that I never published. (laughs) Anyway, Manoli, happy, happy birthday. You're the best. And I love you. Oh, love you too, Bonnie. Thank you so much. All right, from one uh, advisor to the next, from my PhD advisor, I'm now going to my undergraduate advisor, Gerald J. Sussman. The day I walked into Jerry's office, I was, uh, I mean, I was floored, I have to say. I was uh, hum- uh, basically humbled to be uh, with the uh, author of one of the most influential books on not how to program, how to program, that's boring, you can learn that anywhere, but how to think and how to think computationally. And I think uh, Jerry's uh, book on uh, using Scheme, one of the languages he actually helped develop to sort of teach students across the world on how to think about computer science has really shaped me, has shaped my thinking about abstraction, about uh, sort of encapsulation, about uh, the world, about environment, and about how our own brain works through my understanding of how computers work and how computer programs work. So Jerry, you have been such an influential thinker for me and for so many at MIT and across the world. It's truly a privilege to be your colleague, to be your former undergraduate advisor and to be your friend. So thank you so much for having, for, for, for joining us here. It's a pleasure having you here. So take it away. Hi, uh, sort of wonderful to be here. And I'm certainly enjoying listening to all of the stories and I tend to agree with almost everybody about almost everything. Uh, one person that uh, struck me as immediately uh, irrelevant was uh, Martin Renard's rep- point of view that everything is basically a matter of chance. And I think that's really true. The way in which the way in which we have, our lives evolve is mostly a matter of chance. Okay, and that's so. One thing we have to do is make make opportunities to to get luck, the way he put it, or something like that. Anyway, the reason why my hand was up and therefore I wanted to leave soon is because I'm about to go to uh, give away book my new book to the students in my class. Just finished a book on software design, okay, with my Woo-hoo! friend Hanson, just finished, okay, and I'm the first, the, the, I've got, I've got, a, I bought a bunch of them and I'm going to give them to the students in my class gratis, that's what it just feels like the fun thing to do. Um, 
These are the people who are actually, I'm using that book in this class and I don't want them to have to buy it. Uh, the, but I'm gonna try to answer your, your most important question or both questions, I suppose. It seems to me that the advice I gave you when you were my undergraduate advisee, which you may or may not remember, is the advice I still give to everyone. And what it, the, what it is, is there's two most important decisions you make in your life. One of them is how to, the first thing you have to decide is what it is you really want to do. In some way or another, you'll get other people to pay for it. That's the first one. Don't worry about how it gets done. You worry about what you want to do. And the second one is pick the right spouse. If those two things work out, everything else works out for your life. Unfortunately, Julie just went away because she was getting ready to, to do some stuff with us. I remember that advice vividly, Jerry. <laughs> We've been married 52 years. Okay, that's amazing. Okay, and that's, uh, uh, that's the same, the set, basic the advice, okay? Uh, the other thing is you say, looking back, okay? If I were to look back to myself, I would congratulate my younger self for having done exactly what I just said. <laughs> that is, that is, what I've been careful about, and I think everybody should be careful about, is don't, as someone else said, I can't remember who it was, don't, re, don't worry about what other people think about what you're going to pick, the choices you make, okay? It's the, the future is sufficiently difficult to predict. As, as a famous person said, many famous people said, the future, the prediction is difficult, especially of the future, okay? So one thing is you can't, it's very hard to tell what uh, impact or consequence something you do will have in the future. What really matters is that you're having fun doing it while you're doing it, okay? And the reason why that, what that, that was again, the uh, uh, thing I learned when I was much younger. And the reason I learned it was because when I was much younger and working with Marvin Minsky as he was my thesis supervisor with Seymour Papert, okay? Uh, the, you know, we were doing, we were learning about learning actually. Uh, there was another person in the AI laboratory by the name of, uh, of uh, let's see, oh gosh, just lost his name, okay? Famous vision person, um, Marr, David Marr. And he was actually a pretty good friend of mine. He died at age 35 of cancer. And what I realized is, yeah, what I realized is that that you can't predict the future. You can't even be sure you're going to be making it to next year. What you can make sure is that you use every day in a way that you, in, you that you enjoy and that your friends enjoy and that you're, you're working together with others and having and helping them. And so my my overall mm -hmm. thing that I've been doing all my life is that. And in particular, my specific goal that's been all my life is figuring out ways to make it easier for people to communicate, okay? So the reason why I don't think of programming a computer as making a computer do something, I'm interested in the programs as being something I can show to my friends. Yeah. But that's, that's a way of expressing myself in the same way people use mathematics or poetry or any other kind of expressive medium. That the, a computer program when beautifully written can be pretty it can be. It can be. It can have emotional content. It can be. Uh, it can be uh, instructive. Okay, and it, and it's a way of telling people something you can't tell in some other way. Right? That's all. Beautiful. Awesome. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Jerry. Thank you. Next is Daniela Rus. So Daniela is one of the pioneers in robotics, in decentralized robotics, in you know being able to sort of bring uh, you know something that's more than the sum of the parts. And she also is the director of the computer science and AI lab for many years. And she is one of the most positive people I know. She is such a, such a force for good in our lab and such a driver for uh, both celebration, optimism, and really capturing the future. And as she always likes to say, keeping the gradient. So thanks, yeah. Manoli. The last year we've had moments when the gradient once was not so good, but I think we're getting back onto a onto a gradient that we should be keeping. Um, so uh, happy birthday, Manolis. Um, it's uh, it's really wonderful to be part of this extended family celebration. Um, I have to say that there are so many things I like and admire about you and your family, but the fact that you're always in touch with your 
uh, inner boy um, and uh, always uh, with a twinkle in your eye uh, is something I hope you keep uh, into your uh, next uh, 50 years uh, till you get to, um, uh, to, to 100 and you stay uh, as vibrant as you are um, today. And in fact, as I, as I think about all the important work that um, you and uh, everyone else in computational bi biology is doing, I'm really waiting for, your, uh, for you guys to, um, to produce for us the, the youth fountain. So, uh, right, so, so maybe, um, maybe there is that special medicine uh, that we can all um, uh, swallow to repair our DNA um, so we can stay uh, energized and um, and uh, uh, in uh, full force um, all the way to 100. Um, so that's what I'm that's what I'm hoping for for the next 20 years. Uh, I, I just want something that will repair my uh, my DNA so that I can stay um, youthful. We're um, on it. We're on it, Daniela. Not just your DNA, but also your epigenome. So yeah, yeah. we're actually working it. <laughs> the, other, the other thing the other thing I'm pretty excited about is the possibility that someday uh, we will use AI and machine learning and everything we uh, we are advancing on the computing side uh, to make medicine truly individualized so I don't mean personalized medicine because I don't I don't really mean you should prepare a cocktail of drugs out of what exists I would just like medicine to reach the point where we can um, uh, we can synthesize uh, medication just in time for uh, your body for your environmental situation for your uh, for your um, uh, symptoms and so I, I think I think that's coming uh, I, I feel like robotics might have something to to uh, uh, to do um, uh, to to prepare us for a future with better procedures so i'm personally interested in uh, this notion that uh, we will have in the future surgeries um, without incisions um, without pain without the risk of infection by um, by swallowing little robotic devices that could then be controlled to do procedures inside the body without having to uh, make cuts uh, on the body Beautiful. and so um, these are some of the things that uh, uh, that I think will make a big difference for our well-being for the next uh, 20 years. And uh, uh, in terms of looking back to my, uh, my younger uh, self, I would just say that it's okay to make mistakes, uh, that uh, mistakes give you opportunities to, um, to, to leap uh, with your understanding um, of the world and of yourself and that every crisis um, has two parts. There is a danger part and an opportunity part. And it's important to focus on the opportunity. It's important to learn to recognize and embrace opportunities. And I think you, Manoli, already know this lesson. You don't need to be, um, uh, to be told this lesson because uh, I, as I watched you over the last 20 years, I was really impressed by, I have been very impressed by how well you recognize and make the most of um, every opportunity. Thank you, so, thank you, thank so you. So happy birthday and keep your wonderful gradient. Thank you, Daniela. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, I, I love what you said about uh, failure and mistakes. And I think it, it teaches us so many things, including humility, because approaching problems with humility and understanding that you have already failed gives you experience that prepares you in a different way then you, if you haven't experienced failure and mistakes. So I appreciate that advice greatly. All right, so we don't actually have any hands up. So I'm going to just start uh, calling. Uh, actually, Juan's hand is up. Oh, Juan, sorry. I, 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 I just raised it, Juan. So Juan is uh, an amazing, I mean, I'm, I'm a huge admirer of Juan. He is a communicator of, in, of such complex ideas in such beautiful sort of far-reaching ways. He is uh, one of the most prolific and one of the most respected people in our community. I've had the privilege of... Oh, there's, there's noise in the background. I've had the privilege of interacting with you so many times, including uh, giving uh, talks back to back in this conference in New York. Uh, and uh, I've just admired and followed your work in so many different ways and uh, read so many of your uh, writings. So thank you for being here. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Oh, well, I mean, I love this birthday party. 
I think this is just fantastic. Um, what a way to celebrate. Uh, I, I want to keep this short because I feel um, just privileged to be here with, with you. And what I spend, and what I want to spend the next decades on is thinking about how all the stuff that you all do changes the world. And how does it change countries? How does it change societies? How does the ability to read and write life code alter who we are, what a human being is, how an industry is organized, how a country is organized? And for the last 30 years, what I've been thinking about outside my day job and in venture is what does the ability to read and write life code do to the world? And I think we're now at a stage where we're understanding life code well enough that we're gonna be able to program making things like organs and making various body parts. And we're gonna start subbing out our body parts like we sub out our stoves or our fridges or our windows. We will eventually get to the part where we can remodel whole rooms. But the break point, the interesting point becomes the brain because I don't think you get to longevity if you can't understand, reproduce and download part of your brain. I think it doesn't matter if you can make artificial hips, if you can make artificial kidneys, et cetera. You, you just don't break the barrier of 110, 120 in a substantial way until you can go after the brain. So what I wanna spend the next, um, decades on is learning from a lot of you on this call, like Ed and Li Hui and all the folks thinking about the brain, because I think that's the true limit to longevity and longevity is the key to being able to get off this planet and understand other planets, because you just can't do that on a hundred year time scale. The advice I'd give my 20 year old Focus hard on specific things, but stay curious about a lot of things. Keep oh, learning. Beautiful. Wow. Um, you know, get deep in something for 10 years or 20 years, but don't get so deep that you put on blinders to all the incredible stuff that's going on around. Because I think some of the most interesting thinking is orthogonal thinking. Thank and that's it. Thank you, Juan. Uh, all right, so I, I'm seeing messages in the chat of people who have to leave, but basically, please raise your hand. If you can't raise your hand, go to the bottom where it says reaction, just quick raise hand. I see Imran's hand that's raised, and I saw messages from Nikos and from Leonid, who basically said that they have to go. I don't know if Nikos is still there or not, uh, but uh, if you have to go, please raise your hand. Uh, Leonid, are you still there? All right. So Leonid is a friend for almost a, a decade and a half now. Uh, we met when we were both grad students at MIT and stayed friends throughout. He has known many of my wife's uh, close friends for many, many uh, decades uh, now. And uh, he somehow managed to launch his own pharmaceutical company from his garage. And he has a drug that's in, uh, that has successfully completed phase two clinical trial for curing blindness, and he's now launching uh, phase three. So it's an incredible privilege to, to be such a close friend with you, Leonid, to have you in our lives, uh, to have you as the uncle to our kids uh, who just adore you, and to have you in this call. So take it away. Well, thanks, Manuelis, and happy birthday. Uh, I'm always, I always feel, um, it's always such a strange feeling whenever I meet all of your friends and uh, some of them being my friends as well. And it's it's such a humbling experience. And and at the same time, it's such an enriching one. And I'm sure everyone feels the same uh, here. And uh, so I, I'm 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 not shy in a small small group, but I think in in, in a big groups, so I'm usually much shy, more shy. So I'll keep it super short. Uh, I don't have very much to say. Um, but for example, if uh, I think the only thing that I would think about is the, uh, and I've heard so many, so many great advice today from from people of, of their hundred year old self, and and lots of food for thoughts. I took tons of notes, and I'm definitely going to rewatch a replay of this because uh, uh, because uh, because it's just uh, it's just wonderful. Um, I think um, 
I think when I look back personally at, uh, and I'm not uh, nowhere near 100, but I, um, but I know that, for example, I don't think I optimized my 20s as much as I wished. And, um, and, and maybe none of us is our 20s here, but, uh, but I really, if I, if I had an advice to give to myself, and that's the advice I kind of would give to my own kids uh, one day, is, uh, is really to truly optimize your 20s. Um, I think we spend a lot of time uh, either studying or having fun in schools, but the real school is really life. And, um, and, and once we're out of school, um, we cannot continue adopting that kind of lifestyle that we had while in college or when in graduate school. This is to me artificial learning. And of, sorry, no offense to any of these wonderful professors that you guys are, but I think for the majority of people, they will not use what we, um, what we learn in school if you don't stay in academia. And I did not stay in academia. And so in this case, the real school is going to be that school of life, the university of life. That's really where you learn. That's really when you do things. And unfortunately, I see too many uh, young, promising people in their 20s who continue to perpetuate that, that college life. And I think uh, to their detriment and uh, including to my own detriment in the case of, of I, I don't think, let's say, working enough or... Um, um, I think someone mentioned, you know, find your goal and then find your, the right spouse. And it doesn't matter how you achieve that goal, but you need to have one. And uh, I think you need to have a mentor. Um, you need to uh, constantly expand your network. And I'm, I'm just repeating what I've heard here today because it was so wonderful. And I'm one of the last speakers anyways. Uh, try to fail as many times as you can in a, in a more or less safe environment. Uh, because there will be no better time to learn and there's no better opportunity to learn than when you fail. Um, don't be also afraid of success. And I think it's, it's, a, it's paradoxical, but I think a lot of people are truly afraid of their own success and, and eventually end up regressing to, to their old self and their own old confer, uh, con comfortable self. It's, it's something called the upper limit problem, if, if you guys have, um, have heard of this. Um, also, something that I would do more in my 20s would be express gratitude to others. And, um, and the way I realized that is by looking at uh, friends that are elderly and seeing how wonderful in ways that they express gratitude. And, uh, and you see kids that are, and we always call them ungrateful kids. So if at some point we're all going to transform to be uh, wise and grateful, why don't we transition that as quickly as possible? because that's really a much better state of being than being ungrateful. So I think expressing gratitude um, is great. Um, if, if I'm in my 20s, I would not waste a single minute on entertainment. People mention social media as well, but I, I would mention entertainment in general. I would really focus on learning and making my learning truly entertaining. And because when you're, once your learning is entertaining, you're actually entertaining yourself all the time in learning. Um, an, another one, which, um, and again, uh, probably not ask if you apply for an academic job, is people in, in corporations will ask you, what are your weaknesses? And, and each time you, you hear some uh, canned answers. And, um, and, and so I started thinking very much about this problem of what are my weaknesses? And so there's a really good test, and I'll, I'll put the link on the chat called the saboteur test. And I suggest all of you guys do that saboteur test. And you'll see that usually the older you are, the lower your scores, the lower the better. But the younger you are, uh, the higher sum of your saboteurs. And these saboteurs, you create reasons for believing why they're important to you, but they're actually not important. They're actually preventing you from reaching uh, the best version of yourself. And so Beautiful. identify these saboteurs as quickly as possible. And I would suggest anyone who graduates college to, to look at their saboteur and say, okay, this is now my baseline professional person. And this is what I'm gonna do next, fix my saboteurs. Um, I love so, it. Thank you so much, Lenny. Thank you. Welcome, Marilis. All right. So uh, wonderful. So uh, next we have John Titikli. So John is, again, uh, one of the most influential people in OCR, in uh, operations research. Uh, and uh, it, um, he's just uh, 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 one of the uh, closest people I know uh, who, who has been part of that Greek community from the very beginning. Uh, he has these wonderful gatherings uh, at his house. He learned to play the piano as an adult, and yet he plays as a concert pianist. And he has uh, all these uh, Greek professors and entrepreneurs <laughs> come to his house and sing together and love together. And uh, uh, him and, and uh, Daphne have hosted us so many times. 
And uh, he also, um, I, th I think his life perspective in sort of uh, going to Greece for three months every summer just struck me when he mentioned that a few years ago. And the last two summers, I was like, okay, I'm just going to go be in Greece the whole time. <laughs> and that hasn't slowed down my research, on the contrary. And so, so for both embracing research and science and life, uh, you, you are just truly a role model for so many of us. So John, it's an honor to have you here and to be such a friend of yours and uh, just a colleague of yours. So take it away, John. Oh, Manuel, it's actually an honor of me. It's a great event to be here with you and your all your wonderful friends. So congratulations for your birthday. Uh, I'm now in retrospect, I feel even more sorry for having missed some of the most recent editions of your birthday, but your energy, your enthusiasm is really contagious. So I wish I could have a fraction of that as I keep moving along. I guess the only thing that's missing from this celebration is that you have to sing for us a Greek song. <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot. Uh, all right, so the hard questions that you put there about the future and all that, you're probably expecting something deep about uh, science and technology and all this, but uh, this one uh, gets closer to 100 as compared to 20, perspective can start changing. One of the things that I'm learning at this stage is that basically no one is irreplaceable. Uh, you, one can do wonderful things, you can have impact in the world, but also if you slow down and uh, look at things from further apart, it's not that the world is going to collapse around you. Actually, that's even more uh, direct because I just stepped down from running one of the MIT labs, LIDS, and you say, oh my God, is the lab going to collapse after somebody else starts running it? And the answer is absolutely no. It's probably it's going to do even better. So it's uh, this idea that no one is irreplaceable. One can look at it as a sort of sad thing. Oh, I'm not as important, but it's actually liberating. You can just start doing the things that you enjoy. And some of this may turn out to be on your in your professional domain. And some of these may have to do with life more generally. Now, uh, Greeks have a tendency to always ba go back uh, 2000 years ago. So what does one seek in life? There's a famous Greek uh, philosophy term for that, which uh, is eudaimonia. Uh, literally what it means is good demons. That would be a too literal translation, but basically it means that you want to keep the demons inside you satisfied and hopefully it's the better demons, the better angels of you that are quiet and that are that feel good uh, while suppressing any bad demons that you might have and reach a situation of kind of bliss and quietness. Uh, so what's different between being 100 versus being at 20 is that at 20 there's all this uncertainty in front of you, which is a source of excitement but also anxiety. As you get older, you're looking back, uncertainty has been resolved. Hopefully you are in a stage where you're feel good with how it was resolved and you can go and now sit, uh, go towards your other question, what is it that I would have done differently? Uh, ideally, you would think of a few things that you might have done differently, but really have no regrets that you did the best that you could do with the information that you had at the time. Uh, so with hindsight, yeah, everybody knows what was the best uh, investment in the stock market. With hindsight, it's it's easy, but uh, you realize that uh, life is full of uncertainty and you just live with it. If I have any concrete regret, it's only that uh, I only discovered rock climbing at the tender age of 50. If I had discovered it at the age of 15, I would have, maybe my life would have been a little different than it was. And the, uh, the only other sort of little detail that came to mind and somebody, one of your friends mentioned it earlier, is as you move on in life, uh, dear people start disappearing, grandparents and parents and all that. 
So take a tape recorder and go and uh, record their stories and what they have to tell you about their relatives and their life. Because as you keep moving fast, you don't pay so much attention to that. But there comes a time where you say, oh, I wish I knew that part of the wow. history and I don't know it. Wow. Thank so you. Thank you. And keep doing exciting things. para, para, Wow. These are beautiful words. Now from one Greek to another Greek, and uh, after all these deep thoughts on uh, sort of 2000 years of uh, philosophy, I can't help but turn to Calliope, who uh, <laughs> at our Meaning of Life Symposium gave the most beautiful and eloquent answer of what the meaning of life is, which I repeated on Lex Friedman podcast and has been watched about 300,000 times and repeated over and over again as one of the best moments of that entire podcast. So Google become one and Calliope and you will, you will find it. And you can also just simply go to the Meaning of Life Symposium. I don't want to steal any of your uh, limited time here uh, by, by repeating that, but there's no way you can summarize what she said more succinctly than what she did. So go listen to her Pythian answer of become one and the three meanings she gives for it because it will not steal, uh, steal it away from you. Calliope, again, is one of the warmest and kindest and most deeply thought people I know. And she brings centuries of wisdom to every one of our conversations. So it's a pleasure to be your friend. It's a pleasure to have been at your wedding. And uh, I'm, I'm just so, so honored to have you both here. And in fact, Costis, who's sitting next to her, messaged me on Thursday saying, Manolis, what are you doing for your birthday this year? And the reason why all of you got an email on, what was it, Thursday morning? is because he mailed me on Wednesday evening. And I was like, well, maybe I should do something for my birthday. So the reason why we're all here is actually Costis messaging me, uh, you know, 48 hours ago. And in case you're wondering, oh, Manolis, I didn't get the earlier announcement. There was no earlier announcement. <laughs> the only announcement was on Thursday morning. With a oh, wait, Friday morning. I don't remember. Anyway, so very recently. So thank you both. Calliope, you go first. And Kosti, you go second. Well, Manoli, uh, we, we are so glad that, you know, we can be here again. Uh, I hope I haven't turned as red as my shirt with all the, things, <laughs> the good things that, that you said. Um, so here we are, once more, gathered together to celebrate your birthday. And we are prompted to think about the past and the future. And may we share a, a keynote presentation that we prepared with Kosti? No. Very, very short. Very short. <laughs> we prepared <laughs> it just in the, you know. While you're starting the video, Kosti is actually a champion of bicycling. Uh, he, he basically was in the national team and represented Greece in many contests and won several of them. And uh, again, he, he brings the, the motto of a, a, a healthy mind in a healthy body really come to life. All right. Thank okay. you. With your presentation. We are merging our two uh, ideas in, in our collective presentation exactly. as a good uh, husband and wife. <laughs> Becoming one. Right? Um, <laughs> so we are prompted to think today about what lies behind us, which we may call the past, and what lies ahead of us, uh, which usually we envision like that. I don't know. Tour de France, looking ahead, what is coming, and be prepared. But Manoli, what is intriguing is that for my favorite poet, Homer, these two notions of the past and the future, they converge. As for him, the adverb that you see here, and maybe you can try to pronounce, Manoli, you can pronounce it. Opisten. Bravo. So it can mean both at the back, or it can also denote some point in the future. So when I first read that uh, in the Iliad and the Odyssey, uh, I felt surprised and they said, so what are we doing? You know, if we agree with, with Homer, probably we could env envision the future as something that lies 
ever so elusively before us. And so what is happening in our life is that we row backwards towards a fleeting present. And if that happens, how can we seize this moment? And in order to do that, maybe we can turn to another great poet who famously exhorted us to do precisely that, to seize each moment that we have as we set out on the exciting journey of our life. And let me share with you just a few verses from this wonderful poem. The title is Ithaca. And I can read in uh, Greek and maybe you can follow. Perfect. Σα βγεις στον πηγεμό για την Ιθάκη να έφιεσαι να είναι μακρύς ο δρόμος, γεμάτος περιπέτειες, γεμάτος γνώσεις. So these are exactly, μπράβο, τέλεια. <laughs> And this is, of course, Greece. Uh, and I'm sure Yannis Tsitsiklis will feel uh, very happy seeing that. Eh? From Simi. A, a Greek island. So hope that the voyage is a long one. Να έφιεσαι να είναι μακρύς ο δρόμος. Πολλά τα καλοκαιρινά προϊά να είναι που με τι ευχαρίστηση, με τι χαρά θα μπαίνεις σε λιμένας πρωτοειδωμένους. But don't forget. Be mindful, eh? Πάντα στο νου σου να έχει την Ιθάκη. Το φθάσιμο εκεί είναι ο προορισμό σου. Αλλά μη βιάζει το ταξίδι διόλου. Καλύτερα χρόνια πολλά να διαρκέσει. So, this idea of pursuing a dream, but at the same time enjoying every moment, I feel. This is what, you know, we all want to do in our life. You are pursuing a PhD, uh, you, want, you, you are pursuing uh, your career, you want to be a tenure track professor, but at the same time, uh, you don't want to miss out eh, on, on the moments that make life unique, your life unique. And thinking of journeys and thinking of some beautiful moments when you go on a trip, Maybe the dawn, right? The, the early morning is, is a beautiful moment. And maybe this uh, personified goddess uh, can give us a lesson on how we can live our life. And so this is Eos here. Rhododactylos in Homer, the rosy-fingered dawn, who comes with her chariot and she brings light every morning. And let's see her story. Eos fell in love with Tithonos, a mortal, alas. And she asked Zeus to grant Tithonos eternal life. Well, Zeus fulfilled her desire. She was very happy about that, but she forgot a minor detail. She forgot to ask about eternal youth. So her husband grew old and he withered. According uh, to a tradition, he became a cicada later on. He was turned into a cicada. So uh, now that you know it's the occasion of your birthday, Manoli, and on the occasion of everyone's birthday, you know we make these wishes, and you feel that you need to be very careful about what you wish for. And if you wish about living well, and now I will turn it over to Costi. So living well is, is uh, probably best defined according to Aristotle, which you see on the right hand side uh, with his hand down, but uh, it is Fzin and there is uh, no doubt what our motto is and what our license plate reads uh, for more than 15 years now, Calliope and I have had the same one. And so, but I want to emphasize on, on Plato because of the theme of looking back and looking forward. And Plato is looking upwards. So I want to argue that the best way to look forward is by looking upward 
So in the same way that the space rocket engineer is going to build a space rocket that's going to go up first and then is going to move us forward to space in the future. Uh, but also Plato did that because he believed that the world around us is just a glimpse or a shadow of a higher, truer reality, which is eternal and to him was unchanging. And then to complement him with Aristotle, his, his student, uh, Aristotle's ethics emphasize the relationships, justice, friendship, and government of the human world and the need to study it. So this is something uh, depicted by Raphael, as you know, here from the Vatican, and it's called the School of Athens. So I think what Manoli you're doing now and you have been doing for your birthday is similar to the School of the Athens of America, as Boston is called, bringing together the world's best philosophers, mathematicians, engineers, literary folks, and some kinesiologists as well. So I just want to go back and say that sometimes, you know, you might think that you're going forward, but the best or only way to approach your dreams and life is by actually going upwards. And this can uplift us all together collectively. And, um, I think that's uh, the, the best way to, to end this and wish you again happy birthday. And also, we shouldn't uh, fail to mention uh, that... Oh, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. I thought that you were done with your presentation when you said that's a great way to end, so I apologize. Oh, yes, yes, yes. One, one last slide to end. Yeah, yes. yeah, please restart sharing, I apologize. Yeah, okay. Yes, and so this is just Chronia Pola, uh, Manoli, yeah. and also uh, Congratulations to your mother. To your mother, exactly. <laughs> who gave birth to you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I'm sorry I stopped for sharing. No, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Manoli. That watching the image of the rower with his wife in the boat, looking, going back, but so the image that this gave me is that as we go through life, we are moving to the unknown that we don't know. And all we know how to see is the past of what we have already lived. And that is, in a way, the way that I phrase this, looking forward, looking back. And the reason why I phrased it this way is by first placing yourself in the future and then looking at where the future is and now giving advice to your past self. In a way, I was doing this mental exercise of rowing a few more decades to be able to look back. So I really, really appreciate your metaphor. It's just so beautiful. You see, we're perfectly aligned in thought and in action. And I wanted to say my advice to my 20-year-old self would be to have met Manolis in 1999, so five years sooner than I actually did in 2004, because life would have been so much more meaningful. My life would have also as well, Kostis. Just thank you so much. Thank you both. Uh, from one Greek to the next, I now want to go to Katya who is another one of our adoptive parents. So she is uh, the godmother of our daughter, Elora, and she has been the best godmother that we could have possibly hoped for or imagined. She is a role model for Elora. She's a woman who has been a leader in biotechnology. She has founded a company coming out of uh, Harvard, where she was a professor. Uh, she and her husband came from Greece, where they were professors. They are now both academics across the world. And she has recently moved from the company Emulate that uh, she helped launch to uh, Regeneron, that again has been all over the news uh, with many accomplishments, including uh, saving Trump's life, of which I will not comment. Uh, Katya, take it away. So, Chronia Pola Manoli, and uh, happy birthday. and. Uh... It is a real, uh, how can I, it's such a fulfillment to be part of the family, to have you as a family. And uh, uh, you have been around in so many good moments and tough moments. And uh, really, this is life, right? And um, so what I'm doing, what is the exciting thing that I'm doing, not to save Trump's life. It doesn't really matter, you know, when you go to save lives, it does not matter whose life this is. And this is, I think, something that uh, uh, Calliope and uh, Costas also alluded to. And uh, uh, I'm doing what I always did. I was uh, trained as a medical doctor, but I never wanted to 
treat uh, the patients with the existing medications, knowing, as you know also, all the problems there. And that's what I'm doing. I try to understand what disease is and how we can make it uh, something more familiar, if you wish, to us, to know it better so we can handle it better. Are we going to be successful? It doesn't really matter, right? Someone will be successful. And uh, it is the journey, is Ithaca, and this is what I'm doing. Uh, and uh, what uh, we all learned with this uh, last year is uh, one, I think, the fundamental problem, the major gap that we do not have public health policy. So we try to understand the disease and treat, but there is no public health policy. And this is, I think, the main, that's a goal that we should all try to help and um, get in another stage. I don't know how we will do it. I am very uh, optimistic uh, with the new generation because they have seen it all. And uh, through uh, this, uh, this last year, I think was, uh, hundreds of years together. And I hope that we will uh, have the, will be wise and uh, sensitive and sensible to put it all together at a later time, not feeling like we are in our jails, in our bubbles, because we are privileged, but uh, put it all together and do what Laurie said, just be part of a community that will move things to a different stage. Um, and, uh, 20, uh, back to 20 year, just uh, Ithaca and uh, the most important people. This is what brings us all here. And uh, I, I just want to uh, wish you a lot of uh, wonderful years ahead and say something that I learned from these gatherings of yours that uh, I was a little bit uh, skeptical at the beginning. What people will say in such a gathering, it was very revealing not only to be direct, but also to be so open, to reflect yourself to the others, to your people. And this circle keeps growing and growing and we'll be here next year to celebrate again. Ευχαριστώ πάρα πάρα πολύ, Κάτσι μου. Γιαγιά, μαμά, είσαστε έτοιμοι, Μαρία. Έλα, Μανουλή. Δεν είμαι. Δεν έχω βάλει τη μαμά. Α, όχι, όχι, όχι. Okay, δεν θέλεις. Ωραία, μετά, μετά, μετά. Εντάξει. Οκ, okay, so Armando and Sabrina, you guys are next. Oh, oh, sorry, you're muted. So first, we just wanted to wish you a happy birthday. Thank and, you. Uh, you know, it's so, uh, it's so great to, uh, to be here with you and to share one more of your legendary uh, birthday. <laughs> and... Uh, you know, I think uh, one of the things that uh, we've all really admired of you over the years is just this energy that you have that, uh, that is just so contagious. And, uh, you know, this really comes through in, uh, uh, you know, not just uh, in this kind of events, but just in everything you do in, uh, in your life. So, you know, keep it, uh, keep it going. <laughs> I, uh, it's uh, one of the one of the difficult things of uh, getting to speak after so many uh, uh, people is uh, the feeling that uh, almost everything uh, that uh, that I could say has uh, has already been said. But uh, you know, I think uh, I think going back to uh, to this theme, I I feel like I'm not great at giving advice, uh, even if it were to my uh, to my younger self, which is kind of weird, given that that's kind of my job. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, but I do think that there's something to be said for having, having a goal that goes beyond simply the sort of things that depend on what other people think and, you know, having these really broader goals about how you want the world to look like and, uh, and how you want to uh, make things different that uh, sort of helps you get beyond the, the momentary setbacks and the things that, uh, you know, day to day might not be uh, going so well and, uh, and keeps you from thinking about what other people might be thinking and keeps, keeps your eye on the ball. I think it's something that is so, uh, yeah. uh, so useful. I love it. And uh, uh, Sabrina, the idea going forward and uh, piece of advice going back. Um... 
<laughs> kind of caught me off guard there. Um, I think right. we can come back. To you. He pretty much covered it all the way around. But yes, um, first of all, he's right. Wishing you a very happy birthday. And I think um, I think he's right. He, you've always been able to pull a whole bunch of people together, which is super awesome. Um, even even in uh, um, even during COVID, it's impressive to see the amount of people you've pulled together here right now, which is on, on 24 hour notice, no less. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Not everybody can pull that off. So that's, that's, that's pretty awesome. Kudos to you. Um, so congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Sabrina. Thank you, Armando. It's such a pleasure to have you guys in our lives. Um, I see many hands up that have been patiently waiting. So um, for the folks who have their hand up, wave violently if you have to really go soon. If not, I will just, uh, oh yeah, go ahead, Bob, you're next. I, um, so first I want to like everybody else, thank you for organizing this. It's always such a pleasure to, uh, to celebrate with you and to meet so many interesting people and, and, uh, on a day like today to, to hear so much interesting advice. Um, so, uh, so happy birthday. Um, I, the thing that I'm working on that I'm excited about going forward is, is I, uh, six months ago, almost, um, joined a, a startup company that is, uh, taking, uh, naturally occurring mobile genetic elements, transposons and retro transposons and, uh, integrases and recombinases and, uh, characterizing them and then engineering them so that we can use them to, uh, to rewrite uh, and and to repair the genome Dude. to cure diseases wow. um, and and really have the goal that uh, patients will will be able to intervene early enough and effectively enough that uh, you know that children will grow up not knowing that they ever had a disease um, and uh, so I'm I'm very excited about that awesome. technology awesome. going forward um, I I think that the the uh, when you asked about looking back, um, you know, I think that there's a, a tendency to kind of, uh, you know, avoid dwelling on the past. And, and what I realized is that it's not so much about trying to think of this as, you know, what would I do differently? Um, but maybe, and, and to an extent, you know, what is the advice I could give myself now that I can still use for the next 50 years, but also um, what is the advice looking back that I can give to my children or to the, the other people who I'm mentoring um, to help them in the, the journey that lies ahead for them. Um, and so I think that uh, two things that stood out, one of them has been said in different ways by people here already, uh, but there's a, a great philosopher who once said, life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop and look around once in a while, you might miss it. Very um, good. <laughs> yes. Uh, and, uh, and then, you know, something that, that, um, my, that Jen and I do with our kids every night at bedtime is we take turns going around and we say, uh, what was our favorite thing from the day? Uh, and also, um, what was something that we did uh, that was kind or helpful for somebody else? Beautiful. Um, and I, I think that uh, that's something that I, I wish I had made a habit, even individually for myself, when I was much younger, because I think that uh, it, you know, on the days when you have trouble thinking of what was your favorite thing, uh, it, it really, you know, maybe, or, or when you have trouble thinking of what was something that you did that was kind or helpful, it, it uh, gives you a chance to reflect on uh, that maybe that was a day that was not put to such great use. Um, and, uh, and to think of then how you can, can do better the next day. Um, and I love the, the two components, not just, uh, you know, pleasing yourself, but serving others, basically. It's, it's, it's both. And not just serving others, but also making sure that there's something great for yourself as well. Uh, yeah. You know, kind of like they say, uh, put on your own mask before helping others. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, and, and that's what I love to say with, with my wife as well and, and the children. You know, when they ask us, why do you go to dinner? We're like, because to bear fruits, a tree must have a trunk. And our marriage, you know, the fruits of our love, literally, are our children. But the tree has to stay healthy and strong for the children and for the fruit to, to grow strong as well. So you need both. You need to sort of maintain your core and also use that to serve others. 
without yeah. without fruit the tree has no meaning no right to no 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 reason speaking of fruit max you're carrying yours tell us about uh your vision of how the world will change in the next few years what's the key idea that we should be paying attention to and then looking back advice that you would give to yourself yeah so thank you manolis um yeah happy birthday again and uh i'm, I'm happy to share uh, my thoughts together with with my daughter oh, it's her first chance to attend one of your uh birthday celebrations and i hope she can learn a lot someday from them in the future and i wish uh, to do this in person for many many more years with her um, but for for the near future, what, one of the things that, that I've been thinking about is how sort of humanity as a whole is gaining so much knowledge. It is no longer really possible for any individual to contain everything in such a way that like it may have been possible to some extent uh like may maybe a few hundred years ago still yeah and what we it, basically in order to to have an individual ha be part uh or, or have so much on their own is they would need to be in school literally forever yeah. uh their entire lives they, they have or a uh, lifetime every day i would say for yeah just yeah it's it, created every day you need a lifetime to, to absorb yeah. And uh, what we really need to uh, think about as a society is how to uh, focus sort of our children, our, our, our students, on how they can uh, learn as effectively as they can uh, for the time that they have to spend on learning before essentially they need to transition to sort of the, the part beyond the learning where it comes to making progress and making breakthroughs and how we can use sort of effective teaching and uh, make students be able to be a part of something without them necessarily being able to understand everything is yeah. how can we teach them to yeah. make progress together with others. I love and I think I will, uh, I will make a parenthesis here to say that I require that all of my students work in teams for their final projects. And the reason is that learning how to build part of the house while someone else is building part of that house is completely, uh, you know, you can't live without that uh, indispensable in uh, in interdisciplinary science. And frankly, nearly all science is now interdisciplinary. And like you say, you can't master both. You have to learn how to partner. So I, I completely, fully agree with you. Yeah, your uh, I think your class was part of an inspiration as like how it compared to some of the other classes where there was so much less uh, individualized like learning and the group learning that you could do and how like if other classes were maybe as effective as at getting people to learn knowledge, yeah. And by the end of people's education, we would be able to have individuals that are so much more ready to tackle the challenges. Yeah. Anyway, so this is my looking forward. And for looking back, I wanted to say something that I don't think uh, people have alluded to in, in many ways. But to me, it sort of sums down to I would give my 20 year old self the advice to uh, live life like you're going to live it longer like maybe to a hundred than uh just assume that you will not make it that far and to me if sort of you stop to think about the th stop thinking that there's a future both for you and for just like the world as a whole your worldview becomes so much more limited and rooted in the present uh -huh. that uh, you fail to consider sometimes the consequences of your actions wow. uh, or uh, and, and uh, so for someone who uh, has been friends with a lot of people and personally struggled with mental health issues that make it hard to go beyond uh, consider that there's some future that you'll eventually have a chance to experience and uh, just kind of 
seeing that yes there's wow. some, some reason for you to be doing everything that you're doing that uh, would cool. help my 20 year old self so much more beautiful thank you thank you max so much all right so from one kelly's lab alum to another uh Dianbo, uh and then uh, daniela so uh Dianbo, take it away hi hi my name is happy birthday thank you thank you yeah yeah um about a question looking for work so i'm imagining i hope uh, when I'm uh, 100 years old, I can have a vacation on Mars and uh, <laughs> yeah, discuss, um, discuss about a philosophy with a robot. So there are like uh, three things in this dream. Like uh, first of all, uh, the rocket and the spaceship. Secondly, the artificial intelligence part. The yeah. robot have to understand philosophy. Then yeah. the third part is I have to live until 100 years old. So ah. the health part. <laughs> Perfect. And now looking back. Yeah, looking back, so 10 years ago, I think uh, what I want to tell myself 10 years ago is like, uh, I need to be more confident. So I uh, kind of worry and doubt about myself too much. Yeah. And uh, when I was in your lab, I was even too shy to knock on your door to ask questions. So I think I should be more confident and uh, uh, to enable myself to do more things I like to try and uh, I like to ask. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, Dianbo. Daniela, thank you so much for joining us. So Daniela has been just a rock star in almost everything she has taken on. And uh, she has now uh, helped coordinate uh, sort of not just citywide, not just nationwide, but worldwide collection of samples from the subway, from the sewers, from the whole world for monitoring disease and monitoring microbial and viral pathogens across our environment. And very recently, uh, Chris Mason that she worked with, uh, you know, re received a grant for doing such worldwide monitoring of COVID by engaging communities across the world with citizen science, teaching people how to do stuff, and then letting, you know, millions of people across the world collaborate to monitor the whole world with tools that are accessible to all. So this has been truly a model in community building and sort of science outreach in many, many ways. So truly a pleasure to have you here and to have had you at the 42nd birthday as well. So welcome back. <laughs> Thank you so much for just awesome introduction. So I noticed, I think we met like 15 years ago. I was having such like, I was such like, eager person and I was so interested in everything and you couldn't really pin me down to one topic and you were in my poster and asked this awesome question I said damn finally somebody get it and we're so happy that you're actually really like the one who asked the right question and then we stick around it was called Cold Spring Harbor it was 2006 or 2007 long time ago Wow. And, and I didn't even know that you were a PI. I was just like, you were just like a bright PhD student. And I was loving hanging out with you. And I just I make the parenthesis to say that at every conference, I make it a point to even at the American Society of Human Genetics, where 5,000 posters, I make it a point to go to every single poster and understand what it's about. I don't need to understand every detail, but I read the title fully when I understand the title, I look at the figures, and then I move on. And I do them serially from one to 5,000. So it's a pleasure to, uh, to, to know that uh, I, I you know, was able to actually pass the test of at least I knew what it was about. <laughs> yeah, no, it was amazing. And over all these years that um, if I want to look somebody where I actually understand between the lines, I can always turn to you. I know that. And uh, 20, like like last year, your 42 birthday, like, like no, well, two, year, two years ago. Last year, last year, it, you know, yeah. 43 never. Yeah, I know, like two years ago. And, and this one, I'm, I'm so enjoying this because I'm getting to a point in life where I have to think a little bit beyond being, as you mentioned before, uh, uh, being a rat in a wheel, you know, going moving forward. And it's so hard for me to pin myself down because early now I have so many affiliations, so many hats. I have a company which is doing really well in Toronto, uh, Pedigic Surveillance. I'm very engaged in NASA, ESA, space exploration, and I'm still doing so much microbiome well, uh, detection and extremophiles in the world and still in a COVID, also in a university affiliated Working You're a world. renaissance woman, what can I say? I mean, uh, I think you're following the advice that so many have said 
of focus on one thing, but be curious about everything. Don't keep your blinders on. Yeah. So I think you're doing exactly that. That's perfect. And in, in 100 years, what I want to want is that really every, nearly every single organism, of course, it's impossible, but at least we get an insight how the microbiome world looks like extremal files on also beyond the world, like Moon and Mars. And I'm just so eager to see the data. And I'm, I'm just humbled because I think I will see it. And I think I will get some hands on the data because I'm still in the connection. But also from the uh, personal just to, side. Just to uh, say what we say in Greece, from your mouth, to God's ears. <laughs> it will happen, it will happen. And the funny thing is from the personal side is that I'm humble because I life treat me well. I got a lot of opportunities. I never pin myself down. I don't care about titles. Everybody who knows me knows that. I, I'm, I'm always um, like want to see the whole, the connections. As Manolos, and you're inspiring me every time I'm talking to you because you are actually seeing the whole thing, not on parts. And all of you, you, you really give me inspiration today. I have to talk, I have to think a lot about it. So when I'm looking in the future, I want to give other people the same opportunity. So for example, we just founded a new consortium. ISP. We're small people, like we're small, insignificant even, but our mission is to give every nationality and access to data from space and, and also business for, to space. So it's ISSOP and International Space Omics. And it, working together with NASA, YAXA, ESA, I'm still very involved, I still have chairs there, but this is not important, it's just the titles, but the thinking of this gives everybody a chance. And why I'm having this urge to do it is because of my past. Um, maybe not know it, and I'm, I'm full disclosure, I'm a child of a refugee and an immigrant. I grew up with no passport, with a passport of my mother uh, being a refugee state in Germany. Germany is a rich country, but as a refugee, it's, it's hard. It's hard. You, you are treated all the time like a person of second class. And the thing is, like, it, although that time my, my father asked me to quit school, go out of 15 and start working, working because I need to bring the money home. And my biggest dream was being a scientist. With 11, 12, I was reading the organic room. With 13, I was an expert in organic chemistry. My whole dream was just to be once in university, but I know it was impossible for me because I don't even have a passport. We don't have funds. And my parents just decided me to take out of school. My, good, my biggest luck in my life, the changing point was that I found a job in organic chemistry and a university where they're paying me good salary, which I can bring the whole to my parents, support my family, but secretly playing student with the age of 16. And then with 17, I got even more interested. I want to be immunobiology. I want to know what biology means, biochemistry, but I was too young. So I really wanted to be in that institute, but I was not allowed to because I said insurance policy says you have to leave. So, but there was a position as a, as a cleaning woman to swap the floors and empty the trash bins. So I take this job in the morning at five in the morning and in the midnight to clean it up, just to have the chance go in at any time of the day when I have a break and ask, please, is this a PCR? How does it work? What is this a gel? I didn't understand. So I was working from 4 a.m. in the morning until after midnight to be able to learn. And now today with all the information, I'm grateful. I'm grateful that I'm allowed to learn. And I want to wish this, give this opportunity to every other child on this world because wow. they're bright minds out of it. We're just waiting to be discovered. Daniela, this is so, so inspiring. Thank you for sharing this story. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Wow. All right, Imran and then Kostas. Hey, uh, uh, Manolo, it's wonderful to, I, I've really missed your events. They've been always so much fun. And I'm really looking forward to when we can get together again in person. Um, so I think uh, just by way of introduction, I'm part of the entrepreneurship and innovation faculty at the Sloan School of Management at MIT. Um, also have been um, in the corporate world and a serial entrepreneur. Um, so in terms of what's an idea that I'm excited about for the next 20 years, um, I would say, um, uh, learning and teaching, right? So, so the whole area of learning is going through a bigger transformation now 
than it has in the last 200 years, right? I mean, with everything from personalized, adaptive, you know, MOOCs, <clears throat> you know, gamified learning, um, you know, asynchronous learning. I mean, there's so many, you know, rich, new, immersive techniques. Um, and, but on the flip side, we have 258 million kids who are out of school in the world. And, um, you know, the latest statistic I heard, which blew me away, um, uh, one out, half of all children by the age of 10 in the world cannot read and understand a paragraph. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities. So based on that, um, you know, it's the reason why five years ago, I quit my corporate work job and started this organization called Teach the World Foundation, which is looking at using games to teach kids um, literacy. So we've now been doing it for about five years. Um, pretty excited. My hope is that in the next hundred years, you know, we can finally eradicate illiteracy. Wow. Wow. Um, and not just illiteracy, but also um, there's so many kids who are just not getting good education as I gave that statistic, right? There's about, about a billion people in the world who are undereducated. And I think that if you can unlock that potential, um, it'll be amazing. Wow. Um, um, in terms of uh, advice I would give to my 20 year old self, I think what Kaliopi said really resonated with me about, you know, I was so busy, like I, I graduated at 19, I got married, I had two kids and I started two companies before I was 30. So so busy doing all of that, that, you know, you don't pause to enjoy the journey. Um, and I think that's what Calliope said, which is, you know, don't just be so focused on the outcomes that you don't enjoy the journey. And I wish Beautiful. I would, uh, that's the advice I would give my. Tournament. Thank you, Imran. Thank you. Costas, one of my, uh, again, longest friends. So 26, 27 years. It's quite remarkable. It's fabulous to see you again here. Alum from MIT. Now, uh, you know, citizen of the world, living in Europe, working there. Go ahead, Costas, tell me what you're doing. Thanks, Manoli. Uh, it's, it's really great uh, for me to be here. It's uh, my first uh, such event. And uh, actually, it, uh, it helped me a lot. It made me feel like I'm back at MIT in the sense that I feel ordinary in the company of so many extraordinary people, because sometimes we tend to think of ourselves as something. Uh, if we have a couple of titles that we don't care about, but okay, they are around, we hear them all the day, all day long. Um, in terms of the, the two points, first of all, for the one of the benefits, first of all, of being talking late is that I can uh, build and uh, borrow artistically from the previous speakers. So uh, one of the earlier speakers mentioned that everything is an opportunity. I, tend, I think of myself as an optimistic person. And I think everything is opportunity. Of course, we have to be very careful when half a million people or billion, millions of people have already died. So that, but anyway, uh, from my point of view, and as a transportation engineer, I think working from home is going to be a very big challenge and a very big opportunity, which is not only going to change how we move, how materials move, but it's also going to change how cities uh, are structured is going to change uh, aspects like insurance for example because now your home is also your office so there are other things that you have to consider and so on in terms of going back and uh, giving some advice to my younger self I originally did not want to say anything because I'm going through a scenic phase uh, right now for, for various reasons um, but I really liked one thing that Bonnie said of uh, publishing things you might think trivial or whatever along the way because other people make careers out of them. And, you know, for us, sometimes it was something obvious. Uh, and then the other general sentiment that is there about not, uh, uh, you know, pace yourself tomorrow, you can, you know, write that paper or read that book or do whatever but seeing your children, your friends, your parents try to do today because, yeah, you don't know if tomorrow, uh, how far away or where they're going to be. So you, that, you. I'm really sorry, I'll have to go soon. Uh, but you. I benefited, I think, from a large part of, uh, of the event. And I'm honestly looking forward to more interactions with many of you that I met today for the first time or so again. Thank again, you. speaking uh, of... Uh, taking opportunity from, you know, difficult situations, there is no way you could have made it 
here in Boston and here we are talking to each other as if we were in the same room. So it's really lovely to see you again and thank you so, so much. Exactly, thanks. Uh, Michael Grebla is an artist. He's a composer. He uh, writes pieces that uh, sort of bring so many different bags of emotion together, uh, bringing on his Italian roots, but also all of the places that he has traveled to. So we are so fortunate to know him. He has uh, performed some of his pieces that he composed in our own living room in uh, some of our previous gatherings, uh, back when we could fit more than one family in the same room. And uh, it's just so fabulous to see you again. So uh, tell us, tell us, looking forward, looking back. <clears throat> Thanks, Manolis. Um, and where in the world are you right now? Are you already in Australia? Are you in New oh, York? no, I'm in New York. I've been here the entire time. The, the walls aren't very far apart, but <laughs> I make the most of it. And I got yeah. a cat. It's my new buddy. That's how I kind of made it through his years. That is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> like multi-species of uh, football. <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> Yeah, so I guess look, um, I guess what all I'm I'm about, and I've kind of thrown my my life. I feel like you get you know one of them. You have to kind of pick what you want to do to some extent. But I've thrown mine down on, on music and composing. And for me, what I really want to see like change and what excites me about, I guess the work that I'm doing is its ability to bring people together in quite a meaningful way to build community, um, but also to like develop who they are and their identity. Um, and as excited because, you know, I had, I did like an engineering degree as well. And the secret part of me wants to build like spaceships and go to Mars and stuff. But for all the kind of mysteries the universe holds, there's probably an equal magnitude of mystery within ourselves and opportunity for evolution of, I think, who we are and how we kind of um, think about ourselves in the world. Anyway, so, yeah, I, I mean, I want to, yeah, I just want to champion a more kind of inclusive and unified society. We have many different um forms and mediums over which we can disagree and and not be on the same page about things but i don't know how many mechanisms we have for just coming together um and and things that sort of build build us together and, and are always about you know um i think unification i think that's something we've really you know COVID has been terrible for the arts <laughs> really bad uh and i think i think that's something that people are probably a bit more receptive to going forward you know these are actually important things and I know someone mentioned earlier about social media not creating genuine connection stuff. And, and it's true, I think there is a bit of a crisis that we have in, in terms of turning away from a, a lot of, you know, traditional um, means of community building, be they religion or, or, or the arts or, or just, you know, like talking to people face to face, having dinner, people, dinner with people. So that's kind of, I guess, where um, I want to be making some kind of contribution. And I do that by writing pieces for performers, I try to give them a means of expression to in which they can kind of be themselves and say what they want to say and, and bring audiences together. Um, and then I guess looking back, all, I, all I'd say, I think I kind of did what I could with, with, with what I was given and I don't have a huge amount of regret, but I would say it's important to have faith um, and to sort of just know that if you um, if you take sort of small consistent steps, you'll you'll get to where you're going, um, which I, I think kind of piggybacks on um, uh, an earlier speaker who mentioned the importance of not worrying exactly at how you're going to get there, just kind of you know have a vision of where you're going. But I think small consistent steps and having faith that ultimately what you're doing is a good thing um, mm -hmm. and it needs to happen, and you'll find a way to get there. Like uh, we heard earlier, uh, if you don't do it, it wasn't meant to happen. And if it's meant to happen, you will do it. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's actually, that's right. Yeah, I love it. So, uh, Maria, are you still there? Uh, and Panagioti, I think I would love to hear from you as well. And uh, my, my poor mom, it's oh, uh, 2 a.m. Uh, where she is. And she... <laughs> And she is 80 years old, so uh, unfortunately, uh, she should have gone earlier when she was too shy. Hey, hello, Manoli. Uh, hi, Sonia Polan. I'm so glad to hear you. I'm so glad to hear you. No, 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 no. I'm so glad to hear you. Hello. Okay. I'm so glad to hear you. I'm so glad to hear you. I'm so glad to hear you. Okay, my own brother, Peter. Hi everyone, I'm Manolis, his older brother. <clears throat> Thanks for having Let us. Let me make a quick introduction. So, so Peter, 
has been uh, my idol for basically my entire life. He is extremely talented, extremely smart. He has been an engineer since the age of 12. He could basically design things, envision things, see the future, make them happen and bring them to life in ways that I haven't seen in not just me, but in anyone around him. And it's just truly been a privilege to just watch him grow and grow beside him and, uh, you know, watch him learn so much. It inspired me to just learn from so many different domains, from hardware and software and engineering and so many different disciplines. He was a president of the Tau Beta Pi Honor Society at MIT, where he created the Leonardo da Vinci series, where uh, he would basically bring polymaths and scientists and philosophers from so many different disciplines to give monthly talks. And uh, I would say that a lot of these uh, lecture series that we have been organizing at our home are very much an inspiration from these Leonardo da Vinci uh, dinners. So he's now started his own company uh, that uh, has, again, a blend of both software and hardware. He basically has created a company that allows people to order without necessarily having to speak to a waiter from their table. And that goes straight into the you know, kitchen uh, at any restaurant. And he has uh, you know, many, many different connections with large restaurant chains and something that I think at a time of COVID is extremely needed for the world. So his company Trey uh, is I think in many ways transforming our society in a, in a way that sort of both maximizes efficiency and also uh, minimizes viral spread, something that is very much needed nowadays when everybody's struggling, both financially and uh, you know in a in a health uh, crisis. So anyway, Peter, uh, without further ado. Wow, that was a very long intro. Thank you. So we're three kids. We're one year apart. I'm the oldest, then Maria, and then my and then. My parents took us from Greece to France when we were 14 to learn French. And then they took us to the US when I was 18, my sister was 17. My brother was 16 to learn English. That's why we came. And then um, we all went to MIT in consecutive years. I was the, the oldest and then my sister and my brother. Um, we all hang out together. We organized parties together. We went to the the Greek dancing events together and so on and so forth. It was a lot of fun. We took a lot of classes together. Many of the professors were here today, which is uh, amazing to see. Um, and uh, it, it was a, a wonderful journey. Thanks for uh, <clears throat> bringing all these people together, Manardi. That's, that's awesome. Too many people, unfortunately, and uh, not enough time. And um, I think the lesson for me that so far I learned, and I'm not a hundred yet, but I feel like I am because <laughs> it's been quite a bit of uh, struggle, was to uh, appreciate people more. When it was at, at MIT, I focused quite a bit of, on grades. Uh, uh, you, it's all, all of your fault, by the way, it was hard. and. Uh, Less on and when he says all of your faults, he means all of you professors, <laughs> all of you professors including you, man. Um, but spending more time with people, I wish I had more time to, to do that at the time, in every sense. And I think the big difference in the, in the coming years will be that being able to spend more time with people all over the world through technologies like Zoom, like we're doing now, which was unheard of a few few years ago. With my company, I have a team in India, a uh, small team, about 50 people. Working together with them versus just the US counterparts has been eye-opening. That cultural differences, I think it's what's keeping people apart for the most part, but the the thoughts that are that are inside every people's head are similar. And I think once we focus on the similarities and bring those out, I think people will be able to work together better, build better societies, and all of your ideas, all, all of this technology will come to life. And I think that the path to that is being open, being able to see past those differences, past the culture, past the 
you know, the, the language barrier, the, the accent, you know, and, and, and true to connect and work with people. Looking back again, my, my biggest regret when I was 10 is that I was just so busy in school and trying to get good grades. Uh, I should have, but I had ideas at the time. So I had the idea of putting resumes online and I had a, without beta pi, we, we created a technology out of it and we had all the MIT student resumes on a searchable database. I should have started a company sooner instead of working at a other bigger companies, even if they were Google and, and, and others that were fun. So thank you all. Thanks for coming and uh, happy birthday, my mother. Ευχαριστώ πολύ, πολύ Παναγιώτη. Μαμά, μπορείς να μιλήσεις ελληνικά άμα θε ή μπορείς να τα πεις αγγλικά όπως θέλεις. Μαρία, μπορείς να τη κάνεις σαν μιούτσε, παρακαλώ. Μισό λεπτάκι. Μαμά, δεν σε ακούω ακόμα. Μισό λεπτάκι. Ε, τώρα σας ακούω. Μενόλη. Ε, χρόνια πολλά. Happy birthday, be happy, be well, be healthy, and uh, enjoy uh, the, the life with uh, your family and uh, with your wonderful uh, wife and your wonderful kids. And uh, I will give you an advice, a big advice. Leave your kids to do everything they want. Don't say <laughs> your opinion, never. Uh, basically, uh, exact opposite of what you wanted us to do. Okay, that is the <laughs> best thing. And uh, give them the opportunities, but leave them to take the opportunity they want, not that opportunity that you think is good for them. You give the advice, but never stop. Perfect. And uh, I want to, to say very sorry, uh, not for you because you are the third, for the first one, the second one, that <laughs> we made some decision for them. That was not the best. So uh, I have to say, Yeah, I wish you, I wish you uh, always to be happy and to have love in your, your heart and devise that, that love to everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I have to say that uh, I would not be here, obviously, either as a living person or as to what's in my head and what's in my heart if it wasn't for my mom. So uh, she has been a force of nature, her optimism, her energy. She will walk into the New York subway and make five friends before the next stop. She is someone who's just so open, a, yeah, able to basically make people just open themselves up and just you know, speak of so much depth and so much meaning in everything. Uh, she has, all, my, my father was always the technical one And my mother was always the philosophical one. So she taught us how to play, something that my father never learned how to do himself. He taught us how to work hard. My mom taught us how to play, how to dream, how to sing, how to write poetry, how to just you know, embrace philosophy and the world. And uh, I would say that if it wasn't for that and for this, you know, non nothing really matters. So thank you, thank you for giving us countless opportunities for giving us so many for making so many sacrifices for your children and for also teaching us that you know notice she's playing that's <laughs> she can't stop she's still playing and and that's what i love about her she's uh you know at every age uh always such a such a force for good And every time I tell my little one, Elora, like, oh, do you want to speak with Yaya? She's like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And the three of them are just trying to pull the phone because they can't wait to speak with Yaya every single day. So thank you, thank you for making us what we are and for giving us so much and for continuing to give so, so much. All right, next is... Uh, God bless you. God bless you. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, if I can add, uh, I can add mom, uh, yeah, yeah, for this year, in uh, 79 years old, for the first time, she got a bicycle. Like, I mean, I got her a tricycle, but now she's going around for the first time in her life bicycling in the university. <laughs> so it's amazing. It's truly amazing. So she really, it, she has boundless energy and always like embraces playing and, and, and learning new things. Perfect. So, so uh, next we have Ishan, Ilia, and Lucille, and that's what we, or, or maybe Lucille first. Why don't we have Lucille first? So here. Okay, I'm muting my, um, okay, no, actually turn, turn off your, here, I'm gonna, uh, where are you? Okay, perfect. Uh, good, so go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm not <laughs> muted, but I, I mean, first, I mean, I mean, I feel extremely uh, uh, lucky and thankful that uh, I have such a wonderful and uh, thoughtful husband. Uh, it's been for me the most uh, rewarding years of my life. I've been uh, with Manolis. Uh, thank you, Anna. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Peter, for bringing up Zush, uh, a wonderful <laughs> human being. As I said, uh, I've heard several of you mentioning the uh, um, the energy that he convey. Uh, and Daniela, I think you mentioned the eyes and the, the sparkle in his eyes. Uh, that I think that's something that um, has um, changed me and uh, for, for the better, I hope. Uh, but uh, and I'm thankful for that. So thank you very much for being such, such the inspiring person and also to uh, better ourselves. Uh, I've heard a few of you, uh, of you mentioning teaching and learning and AI in the future. Um, I think that's one of the things I'm looking forward to the next uh, 40 years, um, uh, looking at 100. I think AI obviously is going to bring uh, a lot of promises and uh, combined with uh, biotechnology, I think we can really get there. I uh, appreciated Daniela's uh, uh, views on, on individualized, uh, uh, individual medicine, uh, not just personalized but that's something that I think is extremely exciting. Um, but then more in terms of what I do, uh, something that's exciting is Hyperloop. Uh, I like Elon Musk, I think he's awesome. And, uh, and I'm looking forward to, to his next uh, SpaceX. Uh, so that's one of the few things I want to see um, before I turn 100. And then uh, something I would tell my younger self, I, I, I've, I haven't uh, really thought about it, but um, um, I'll, uh, as someone said, it's, uh, um, I think the, the, the key one is gratitude. Uh, I think something that Leonid said, and also I think uh, Max uh, is another person, Bob also, uh, something telling your kids, what did you do today that was great and something that maybe that was not that great or what are you thankful for? Or maybe waking up some other people have another way of looking at gratitude, but waking up every morning and saying, uh, what am I thankful for? Or today, what, what am I going to do that will make uh, uh, someone else happy? And so if we start with that, or if we end our day with that, wherever you like it, I think uh, it can really have an impact. And I wish uh, I had had that advice or I had started uh, much earlier. So, I mean, if you have young kids or if you want to study a bit right now, there's a lot of uh, literature on, on being grateful and how it impacts uh, you and your business. Because I think a lot of successful uh, leaders uh, today recognize that being uh, grateful has enabled them uh, to go to the next level of, uh, of success. And I have to say that just like I introduced everyone, I will have to introduce my own wife <laughs> to basically say that Lucille is child number two of a family of six. And when I first met her parents, when I first met her mom, the, 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 the force of nature that basically rose, uh, that, that, that you know, brought up those six, six kids, being able to go back to France and have 12 cousins all together in you know every age you can imagine between you know one and you know uh, sixteen every year there's one of you know one one of each and uh, watching them uh, play together watching the you know watching that family environment uh, I think brings something that uh, is just so unique basically watching the family values from her family uh, being being able to meet somebody who 
has that same strength of holding the family together, being able to sort of bring up our kids together, complementing each other in so many ways. She basically makes it so easy for me to, uh, to, to just focus on the things that I can do while she does basically the rest which is uh, <laughs> he does it all. He does it all. <laughs> anyway so the last two are actually all uh, friends of our family so speaking of you know first my parents then you know my siblings then my uh sort of uh wife and our children who are downstairs <laughs> playing the piano Ilya and Gishan are both uh, dads of classmates of our children so it's fabulous to have both of you here so Daniel maybe you go first uh, sorry I mean Daniel's dad Gishan and then in yeah. the next, so Kishan. So, I, so I have to say that when mm -hmm. I ask my son, uh, Jonathan, uh, how he's doing at school, he says, well, you know, I'm, I'm very good in math, but, but Daniel is better. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, I think uh, Kishan's uh, son, Daniel, is, uh, is an amazing, amazing child. He's a prodigy when it comes to the violin. He's a prodigy when it comes to math. He's uh, truly just a true pleasure to have our, our son interact with Daniel and learn from him and learn with him. So Gishan, you've been such a kind family to us. You've always been so generous. Uh, one of my favorite moments is when Gishan from his balcony with Daniel and Jonathan from our balcony were basically playing the violin together, uh, <laughs> you know, maybe 200 feet from each other <laughs> and just synchronizing their music to each other over the phone while they could see each other in the pandemic, in the heart of the pandemic, when we couldn't see each other, it was just so wonderful to share that humanity at a distance while still having, uh, you know, each other's view. So anyway, Gishan, uh, uh, Gishan, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Manolis. Happy birthday. Um, thank, thank I'm very really grateful to join this uh, online gathering. It's very special. Yeah. So I, I already hear so many people talk about so many things full of wisdom and really, you know, very thoughtful. So my looking forward is, you know, by observing the world around, I, I do feel like if it would be great, we, we are be able to have a, like a robot teacher. I mean, who can have like quality, you know, teaching like a professor at MIT but can somehow spread that knowledge to any kids in the world. Because from this pandemic, I also observed, I was a bit surprised. So many people still not really, you know, believe science in a, to, to a great extent. And that makes me feel it's even more urgent to have such a robot. <laughs> and, great. you know, looking backward, I know my advice to my 20 self is be patient be focused and be positive. Wow, beautiful, beautiful. Patient, focus and positivity. Wow, lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kishan. All right, Ilya is another force of nature. So he uh, is a, a chess champion himself uh, with a rating of 2000 plus. His daughter was the number one ranked chess player in the United States last year. He has been coaching uh, baseball, and soccer and, and chess and tennis. Um, he is giving his time so generously to all of the families in our neighborhood. And he's just such a kind friend. And, uh, you know, I haven't even spoken of his day job of which he will tell us more, but uh, Ilya, your family is so much a model for us in how to, you know, bridge both the academics and the extracurriculars and how to bridge both the family life and the work life that uh, you inspire us every day. So Ilya, take it away. Thank you. Thank you for the kind words, Manolo. It feels like a cozy after party. I feel we should all be holding a tequila shot, you know, and uh, right, there's a few of us. It's almost time for tequila. We've been here for two yeah, 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 right. and a half hours. Yeah, so th thanks, Manola. So uh, yeah, uh, Jonathan and David, actually, when you guys moved to Brookline, I think it's, you know, one of the first people that uh Jonathan met was David in the playground playing soccer and so yeah, they continue yeah. to yeah that's great uh yeah I, I work in quantitative finance so I you know in global macro and we have uh, predictive models that predict the market so that's what I kind of do in my day job but uh, more importantly your 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 thank you for including me Manolo this has been great and really made me uh, think about kind of more macro in terms of you know kind of well around us and I think 
the biggest, I don't know what the solution is, but I think the biggest challenge, uh, one of the biggest challenges right now, we've talked about it quite a bit, is really the attack on the, uh, on the truth or attack on facts. And a lot of the debates that are happening now, especially political debates, is not about political philosophy, about is about facts. And people just have different views on what facts are. So I don't know how to solve this yeah, problem, yeah. but I think we all recognize it is a problem. I think we should all do our part to address it. But I am optimistic there could be something big and structural that can help alleviate this. I just don't know what it is. Yeah. Um, but, you know, challenge everyone to think about it. And um, really, yeah, I will make a parenthesis here to quote Plato's Republic, where he basically says that it is from democracy that tyranny arises. Sorry. Because what happens in democracy, and this is a little bit of what we're living now, is that there is no authority left. He, he, you know, Plato has many, many flaws, but there's something very poignant that he caught onto that, where he basically says that the tyrant arises as someone who will come from the aristocrat, but pretend to come from the people and pretend to support the people, but still somehow the, the will of all of these people to have some more structure when everything is free, when everything is unstructured where the student doesn't respect the teacher anymore, mm -hmm. where everyone's opinion is respected as little or as much as the knowledge and the expertise. And it's kind of striking to see this foreshadowed two and a half thousand years ago with you know, uh, what we've seen in uh, the usurpation in many ways of our society by this you know, sort of complete denigration of knowledge of expertise etc and with you know whoever shouts the loudest is who's right because he's still shouting when everybody else has finished their you know sensible arguments so it's a very difficult uh situation but i think it's somewhere where we need to start perhaps respecting that someone has a phd in economics for 15 years or a phd in physics and so on and so forth and actually value their, you know, not just their perspective, but their, the knowledge that they bring and the embracing of facts and the embracing of expertise, not just your ignorance is as good as my knowledge. It's, you know, I will be humble for the things I know nothing about. Just I expect others to sort of listen to me for the things that I do know about. So there's, there's something to be said there. So yeah, I don't it, have an answer, but again, something where this is an immense problem. Yeah, hopefully a lot of smart people can start concentrating on this because uh, it's very difficult to solve, right? It's the debasement yeah. of what is common knowledge and yeah. what is yeah, common yeah. thing of truth. But, but at the same time, this should not come at the, at the loss of a voice for those who have traditionally not had a voice. I think of course. we basically need to struggle with the two forces. On one hand, the democratization and the access to knowledge, but also the ability to have facts stand for something. Yeah, yeah, completely agree. And in terms of advice, I guess I give to a twenty-year-old. Um, I think the main, the 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 thing is to spend energy on what's important. Now, how do we define important, right? And so I would say it's important uh, it, to triangulate between what's important to yourself, what's important to your friends and your family, and what's important to society. Um, and to spend and to really be able to do all three, because uh, we've seen a lot of people really concentrate on one of those, maybe two of those, and kind of regret not paying attention to the third. So really triangulating between those three and really trying to understand, have the foresight, what is important. And that's very difficult by itself to all kind of those three uh, parties. So that's that's what I would say. And let me finish with that. Since you birthed him, Anolis, um, I have a feeling, and I haven't known for you as long as uh, you know, the rest of folks here, you've done a pretty good job at all those three things and kind of diversifying that and really contributing to all those three aspects. So maybe I will say uh, advice to a 20 year old is be like Manolis. <laughs> um, thank you, thank you so much. It's very, very generous of you, but I am still learning in so many ways. I am still, like Ayopi said, uh, one, looking at the world with embracing, uh, you know, the marvelous things that are happening around me with this 
with the astonishment of a one-year-old and I'm still uh, forever a student uh, while trying to be the other one that she said of trying to become good at many, many things that I know very little about just by working hard and studying hard and learning hard. Um, this is, uh, I feel that I am the last man standing who has not actually given answers. And I was initially not planning to give an answer. I was like, well, um, you know, it's my birthday. I get to make the rules. So <laughs> I don't have to answer. But I am inspired by so many different uh, answers here. And I, I feel compelled to offer my own perspective on questions one and two. So question one, about one key idea that will reshape our world in the next 50 years. Um, my key idea would be doing more of what we just did now. Not just everyone in their own domain and discipline focusing on our day job, but stepping back, reflecting, sharing, mutually respecting one another and learning from the perspective of so many different diverse points of view. Being able to hear uh, just true wisdom from everyone you meet, from, you know, the person that, that you meet on the subway, like my mom would, you know, sort of interrupt uh, the ride of fellow passengers and just listen for their advice, for their wisdom. Because wisdom is not something that you read in Plato and in Aristotle and in the, you know, uh, ancient wisdom is something that you you uh, hold on yeah wisdom is something that uh, is emanating from the agglomeration of perspectives. It, it, wisdom stems from diversity of perspective. Wisdom truly stems from the kind of sharing that we're doing now, the kind of interactions and exchange of ideas. So basically, I think the you know the the looking forward that I think will have an enormous impact on the world. Beyond, of course, on all the scientific advances, the AI, the engineering, biology, etc., which is my day job, is the evening uh, sort of interactions that we can have of having dinner together when things reopen, being able to sort of have these conversations that go beyond the technical and sort of really touch upon the heart and the mind and the soul, not just the brain and uh, the and the knowledge uh, and, and the technical parts. The second part of looking back and what advice I would give to my 20 year old self, um, you, I, I ask you to go back and reread the passage and the way that I wrote it, which had nothing to do with regrets. It was all about what would you do more of? <laughs> and, uh, and many people said, what would you change? It's like, no, no, what would you do more of? And I don't know if somebody has it handy, but uh, let's see. Uh, Question number two, what piece of advice would your 100-year-old self give your 20-year-old self to best prepare you for the rest of your journey to 100? And again, this whole concept and eloquently pointed out of rowing with our back towards where we're going, where we can only see where we have been uh, and have a, a more meaningful or more impactful journey. What skills would you sharpen? What hobbies should you expand? What connections should you cultivate? What behaviors and routines should you reinforce? None of this is negative. It's never, what would you not do? And part of the reason is because uh, if I were to go back to my 20 year old self, I would make all of the same mistakes all over again, maybe more violently so. I would fail more miserably and I would choose the wrong path more assuredly because if I were to negate any of the things I did wrong, any of the mistakes and the setbacks that I had, I would not be here where I am now. If the thing that I was trying to do succeeded, the thing that I did instead would not have happened. And what we are is an accumulation of paths that were blocked and led us to where we are now. Like the water in a river hits every rock and then changes. And if you decide to remove that rock, the river would no longer be the river that it is. So I frankly would not choose to fix any of the horrible mistakes that I made and that I still, on days of weakness, still regret and simply say, you know, by golly, 
I have no regrets. I, you know, did many, many things wrong, but I would do them wrong again, because it is through that humility that you achieve, through the mistakes that you make and through the failures that you live, that you become the person that you are. And if we can't grow through those mistakes, then we are not a complete person. And I thought I was last, but we are privileged to have my sister from another mother, Shadi Kurosh, uh, one of the most astounding people in our community. She is a professor at Harvard. She's the author of five books in the last two years. She is a surgeon and she is a thinker and she is a descendant of an ancient culture of Persia, uh, which is the arch rival and enemy of Greece, of course, but uh, truly someone that uh, has an immense mutual respect for one another because if it wasn't for barbarians, we would build no weapons and have no engineering and uh, you know have no strategies and have no need for culture and uh, all of these things that are driving it. So Shadi, are you actually there? Yes, a big brother. I am on a plane wearing a mask, probably bothering lots of people right now. But uh, I'll take it in order to uh, see you and wish you a happy birthday. I am very grateful to have you as an honorary family member that I continually uh, learn from and I am always entertained. So happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you, Shadi. Any words of wisdom for looking forward and looking back? I think uh, you have summed it up for us that life is a group project and our success has everything to do with the team that we build and grow with. And I am honored and very grateful to be a part of your